sitting up front. Thank you very much for the opportunity to attend this meeting. Um, Please turn your mic on. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. I'm Berkeley Allen, council member for District 18, which is home to three historic districts. Um, and I just want to touch on a topic y'all are going to come to at the end of the meeting that I don't claim to be an expert on, but um, I understand you're going to be talking about detached accessory dwelling units and what the standards for those are. Um, Robin held a, a very helpful meeting of the leaders of the neighborhoods that have historic meetings, and this was one of the topics that we discussed. And and um, it seems that some of the issue is that um, there are some members of neighborhoods and architects that feel that the guidelines are so specific, as opposed to being general guidelines, that they are creating cookie cutter type of detached accessory dwelling units. And in some instances, making the footprints be larger than they need to be because of the two foot setback for the dormers. Um, I'm not an expert on this, as I said, I'm not an architect, but some architects that I expect, that I respect tremendously, um, would like to see perhaps some more flexibility in those guidelines. If I've understood the agenda correctly, some of what you'll be talking about is whether to expand those guidelines to include all outbuildings. And I would just perhaps ask that we could have a more extended discussion involving the neighborhoods to whom these guidelines apply before any, an official policy change is made. So I would just um, ask that, that a good, great discussion happen. I will watch it later, um, but, um, but that I would I would request that no hard and fast decisions be made yet and, and until perhaps the neighborhoods that will be subject to these guidelines have an opportunity to to, to be um, involved in the discussion or to weigh back in as well. So thank you for your for your thank you, Council Lady. Um, I think you were referring to the outbuilding and Dadu policy discussion. Yes, I apologize. I know it's helpful to know that before sure. I start speaking. Yes, it's like next to last on your agenda. It is. Okay. All so, right. Let thank me, you for um, your consideration. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I need to read our protocol for today. For each case, there will be a public hearing. We ask that the applicant keep their presentation to under 10 minutes. They may reserve two minutes as a rebuttal. We ask that the public keep their comments to two minutes unless they are representing an organization or group and they may have five minutes. Appeal of decision from the Historic Zoning Commission pursuant to the provision of section 2.68.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws. Notice is hereby given that a final hearing before the commission is appealable to the Chancery Court of Davidson County or the Circuit Court of Davidson County, viz. a statutory writ of certiorari. You are advised to seek your own independent legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements are met. You should also seek independent legal advice regard, regarding the applicability of the writ of certiorari to the specific decision of the Historic Zoning Commission. The consent agenda uh, will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. Robin, do we have any changes to our agenda? Yes, we have had a request to move 920 Walker to the consent agenda. They have made the changes that um, staff was requesting. 532nd <coughs> Avenue South is deferred until next month, the request of the applicant. 714 Shelby is uh, deferred till next month, the request of the applicant. And then there was some discussion, this may change now that you've heard from Council Member Allen, uh, to move the DADU policy up before the previously deferred items as it may help in your discussion on that particular topic. And so those are the items that we actually need to approve that change the agendas? Yes. Okay. We've heard, we've heard her uh, <coughs> recommendations, so we should, so moved? Second. So it is moved, uh, it's approved. Okay, so. Um, and I'd like to introduce um, Jenny Warren, who is going to be filling in for Melissa Saja while she's on maternity leave. She has had the baby and is doing very well. And she's going to read the consent agenda today. Okay, thank you. And we need to approve the minutes of March 15, 2017. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Any opposed? All in favor? Aye. Thank you. All right, so consent agenda, please. Oh, now we're remote. 
Okay. And welcome. How do I use it? Welcome. Thank you. All right. Here we go. All right. 1500 Fatherland Street is a new construction addition. We've got 1909 Russell Street is new construction of an outbuilding with a setback determination. 1805 Fatherland Street, new construction of an outbuilding. 1103 Montrose Avenue, new construction, addition and outbuilding with a setback determination. 1900 Fifth Avenue North, new construction of an addition. 3637 Richland Avenue, new construction, this one's infill with an outbuilding and a setback determination. 751 Benton Avenue, setback determination for a previous approval. 2200 Grantland Avenue, new construction of an outbuilding. 1319 Fourth Avenue North, new construction of an outbuilding. 105 Broadway, signage. 1115 Greenwood Avenue, setback determination for a previous approval. 1926 20th Avenue South, new construction of an outbuilding. 120 2nd Avenue South, new construction, infill, changes to a previous approval. I don't know what happened. I'll just keep going. Okay. 1237 6th, 6th Avenue North is new construction of an addition. 1407 Lillian Street, new construction of an addition. 1608 16th Avenue South, new construction of an addition with a setback determination. 1810 5th Avenue North, new construction of an addition. 400 Broadway, signage. And then I believe we also added 920 Walker. Wall Church. Wall Church, okay. I don't know what that one was. And that's all of them. Okay. Okay, just want to make sure you had yeah. closure there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any questions to the staff? I move for the consent agenda. Okay, there's a motion. Is there a second? Okay, all in favor? And the consent agenda passes. Our first on the agenda is the Eastdale Place Conservation Overlay. The Eastdale Place uh, neighborhood, or the Eastdale neighborhood, began discussion about a potential overlay in 2015 as part of an overlay for the greater Jackson Park neighborhood. Eastdale Place is an early 20th century planned suburban development that is part of the Jackson Park uh, National Register of Historic Places District. It's significant in the area of community planning and development as an excellent representation of the expanding national suburbs and evolving national trends um, in suburban planning. The district is also significant for its architecture. More of the history is found, of course, in your design guidelines, which were part of your packet, and in the National Register nomination. So this is fairly easy one for you. You're just recommend, recommending approval based on the fact that it's already listed in the National Register, so it meets Section 5 of 17.36120 of the ordinance. So staff suggests that the commission recommend approval of the overlay for these eligible properties to the council and adopt the design guidelines proposed for the new district. Several emails were received in support of the overlay and were forwarded to you and are on your in front of your uh, chairs as well. And I believe there are several people here from the neighborhood who would like to, uh, the councilman was not able to be here, but he also sent a letter. Okay, thank you, Robin. We will open for public hearing. Please step forward and say your name and your address, please. Good afternoon, my name is Candy Henry and I live at 1233 Plymouth Avenue, which is part of the proposed overlay. Um, let me start by saying thank you. Historical preservation is important um, and I realize Anybody who's read the packet knows we're not in the business here of making aesthetic judgments on what is good and what is bad. We're thinking about what is worth preserving. And we, if we don't preserve, we can't learn from our history. The flip side of that, of course, is if we don't make room for new construction, we can't learn new lessons. Um, so thank you for your work. 
while I was reviewing the proposed design guidelines, something struck me, particularly with respect to the street that I live on. Um, and the quote is, a slight departure from the neighborhood designed wholly with straight streets by incorporating a slightly curving off street, Plymouth Avenue. Plymouth Avenue is actually in many ways a departure from the surrounding avenue. It's not just a slightly curving street, um, but particularly with respect to its architecture. I couldn't help but notice of the 18 properties that are identified in your design guidelines packets with little pictures beside them, um, only two of them are from Plymouth and one of them is a ranch. Um, the description in the guidelines also says that the district includes 18% of both English cottage and colonial revival styles, 13% Tudor revival, and 5% craftsman styles. But if you do the math, another way to think about that is you combine these three architectural styles that don't really have anything to do with each other and add them all together, you still end up with 67% of houses that aren't necessarily uh, in a conforming pattern. And, and I know the packet talks about there's not necessarily an academic style, but really specifically even more, I would bet if you look at those 67% and the reason that those Plymouth Avenue houses aren't listed in the packet is because that's where the vast majority of what I'm using the word non-conforming um, comes from. Um, I have some pictures. I'm sure that these have been made available to you, I would hope, um, with respect to Plymouth Avenue. But it's very easy to flip through and see that when you're looking just at Plymouth Avenue in isolation, the rest of what you're talking about in the design guidelines just don't seem to apply. So since it's a real departure, the Secretary of the Interior's guidelines say an overlay can't create a false sense of historical development. And I'm a little concerned academically that that's what's going on here, but that's academic. From a practical matter, and here's where I have to out myself as a lawyer, um, what it means is there's just gonna be a lot of potential for confusion on Plymouth Avenue. Because some of these houses are getting older, they're gonna need repair work. The upshot is, is what's gonna happen is it's gonna be, I don't know. Every question, every house, because every house is different, and even if you take them according to the guidelines of where they are today and you grandfather in what exists, I'm concerned that as a practical matter, it's going to create administrative headaches just because this particular street, frankly, doesn't look like Riverdale and doesn't look like Eastdale. So what I, I would appreciate your consideration of that as you move forward with the guidelines. I'm not making a judgment over whether historical overlays are good or bad, or even whether over the rest of Eastdale Place is good or bad. I just think from an administrative perspective, we're setting ourselves up for problems if we include Plymouth Avenue in this. Thank you. Just a matter of mechanisms today. Who's keeping track of time? Okay, thank you. Sure, 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 thank you, Melissa. Good afternoon, my name is Rod Bain, my wife Marcia, and I live at 1248 Plymouth Avenue, and our house is within the boundaries of the proposed East Dale Place conservation overlay. Our interest in our neighborhood began in the late 1970s. <clears throat> we actually singled out 1248 Plymouth Avenue, and amazingly, it became available six months later, and we jumped at the opportunity to buy it. Um, many of the reasons we chose to live there in the late 70s are still the same reasons we choose to stay there today. The character and charm of well-maintained homes is one of the, those reasons and it still attracts newcomers to our area today. I've had several conversations with my adjacent neighbors and they too support the proposed conservation overlay. We all share similar values for our neighborhood, including the look and feel of our homes. I feel overlay protection is necessary to maintain the character of our homes for my wife and I in years to come, as well as the future owners of 1248 Plymouth Avenue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Allison MacArthur. I live at 1120 Eastdale Avenue. My home is within the boundaries of the Eastdale Place Conservation Overlay. 17 years ago, I was a young educator looking to purchase a home in the urban core, which was not popular at the time. But um, I looked around Nashville and I chose Englewood for many reasons. Um, some being that the character, the character of the area, the large trees, the architecture of the home, and the history of the area. 
I loved hearing the old, old stories from my neighbors at the time, who many of them were in their 80s. They would share family pictures with me, and I could see, uh, you know, their families growing up with the homes that were still there and are still there. I also, at the same time, couldn't help but feel some regret when they would tell me stories about old homes and buildings and businesses that were no longer there. Um, I'm hopeful that the character of our neighborhood will be preserved with guidelines of the overlay as Nashville continues to grow. Because I'm pa passionate about protecting the character of my neighborhood, I volunteered to knock on doors um, as part of this project. It was great to meet many of my young new neighbors that I had not had the opportunity to meet, and it was great to hear that the majority of them valued our neighborhood and the character just like I value it. I hope that you'll vote in favor of the conservation overlay. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, my name is Mark Hosford. I live at 1240 Riverwood Drive, which is that beauty in the lower right corner right there. Um, I live within the boundaries of the proposed Eastwood Place conservation overlay, and I am completely in favor of it. I've knocked on dozens of doors, talked with neighbors about this initiative, and have heard overwhelmingly positive response for conservation overlay. I have lived in East Nashville for 16 years. I moved here after driving around the neighborhood, instantly falling in love with its historic charm. It has a rich history that is interwoven with the rich history of Nashville itself. Take my house, for instance. Uh, Patsy Cline, the great country singer, was a regular guest in our house, and she was uh, friends with the family that originally built it. And a lot of the family still lives in our area and was able to tell me many of the stories. Uh, I want to preserve our neighborhood because a neighborhood is more than just a number of houses on a map. A neighborhood has a rhythm and a feel to it. We attach our emotions to our neighborhood, allowing us to fondly think of where we live as home. It only takes one or two out of place homes to change the feel of a neighborhood forever. Unlike other areas that try to act retroactively once the rhythm is disrupted and lost, we have the unique opportunity to put in place measures that can preserve our neighborhood before irreversible damage is done. I love my neighborhood. I love walking up and down the street, enjoying the beautiful homes in my neighborhood. And I want to ensure that future generations will have the chance to fall in love with it just as I did. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Deborah Lunn, and I live at 1127 Riverwood Drive, which, was, which is within the proposed conservation overlay. Um, when I heard about the possibility of a conservation overlay, I had to get involved, even though it meant I had to go way outside my comfort zone, like right now. Um, I've lived in my house for 17 years, and it was the charm and character of the neighborhood that brought me to Eastdale Place, and it's what keeps me there. For the past six months, I've been knocking on doors and talking to neighbors about the proposed conservation overlay. I've gotten to see up close the unique and beautiful architectural details of the houses. But most importantly, I've spoken with most of my neighbors about the proposed conservation overlay. I've met lifelong residents, I've met young families, and I even met a woman who, as a young bride, was carried over the threshold of her house 53 years ago. The common thread is our desire to preserve Inglewood Place for the future. We agree that Eastdale Place is special because of its character, its unique history, and its local charm. These qualities are invaluable not only to our neighborhood, but to the Nashville area as a whole. As we seek to move forward, it is crucial that we also conserve our unique past. This is why I'm in favor of the proposed Eastdale conservation overlay. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sheridan Williamson and I live at 1141 Riverwood Drive inside the boundaries of the proposed overlay. Over the last six months, a group of neighbors in Eastdale Place have gone door to door on every block inside the proposed boundaries. We were very intentional about going slowly with this process, talking to neighbors, answering questions, engaging support. Today, I can tell you with confidence that 85% of the neighbors we have spoken with have expressed a desire to have an overlay in place for their property and have signed a survey in support of the proposed Eastdale Place conservation overlay. I support this proposed overlay because I believe it reflects the informed choice of our neighborhood. This is something that has been discussed among neighbors going back several years, even back to early 2014. Last fall, we began knocking on doors and talking to neighbors about this potential. 
In February, Councilman Davis hosted a well-attended meeting at the Inglewood Branch Library for neighbors who were notified about the get-together via mail, and staff from the Metro Historic Zoning Commission was there to talk about the purpose of an overlay and answer any questions that anyone had. The reception of neighbors at the meeting reflected what we had been hearing in our conversations up and down the streets. This is something that a vast majority of neighbors do desire for their neighborhood. I hope we, you will respect the informed wishes of the residents of Eastdale Place and their desire to provide guidelines for future development and protection of our historic homes. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sylvia Johnny Tropany, and my husband and I have lived in that house in the upper left-hand corner for the past 10 years, and we support the Eastdale Place conservation overlay. We were drawn to this area because of the historic homes and large lots, and we plan to live here for the rest of our lives, and would like to share the special qualities of this area with our neighbors and future neighbors. While all neighborhoods change over time, they can be, that can be both exciting and soul-crushing. To have a conservation overlay that thoughtfully manages change with a cohesive plan in place is the best long-term solution to have responsible growth. I'm a realtor by trade and am daily in tune with what is drawing folks to move to Nashville or to move from the suburbs to the historic hub. If too much of the original history is torn down, then I fear that the draw is not so compelling. Daily, we see the momentum to tear down, and I feel that with a conservation overlay, the developers would be required to connect a little more with the soul of the neighborhood before breaking ground. My husband and I own rental property in two other conservation overlay districts, Lachlan Springs and Greenwood. We feel that both short-term and long-term, our property values there are higher because they are in conservation overlay neighborhoods. We can also command top rent because they are located in highly desirable areas because of their historic character. So from a purely financial angle, we feel like the conservation overlays are helping protect some of our biggest assets. <laughs> At the end of the day, in looking at our future in this it city, I fear that we might tear down too much of what is a part of the magic that draws folks here. Buildings and architecture are connected to the soul of the culture here, whether it's Lower Broad, Music Row, or a little Inglewood neighborhood, once it's torn down, one can't move backward. I'm interested in moving forward with the growth in this city with some thoughtfulness and Time. grace through conservation overlay want to be stronger and live in a really vibrant place to call home. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ryan Campagna. I live at 1308 Plymouth Avenue, which is in the boundaries of the proposed overlay. Uh, I'm opposed to the proposed overlay for two reasons. First being, uh, we purchased our home in October 2015. Um, and we purchased in this area because it was very vibrant, growing quickly, and uh, fin uh, buying a house is the largest financial transaction that most people make. Um, my fear with the overlay is that it will cap the potential property value of the property based on the massing guidelines. So your property is composed of two components, your, the structure and the actual land, and most of the property value in Nashville has risen because of its location, uh, not because of the structures placed on the property. So I fear that in putting these design guidelines on top of these areas, it will artificially cap the uh, value of these homes because it limits the massing. So you can't build a larger house, you can't build, based on the guidelines proposed, anything larger than a one and a half story home. Um, I just fear that that will cap the property value. Secondly, based on the community character guidelines set forth by Nashville Next, the prop, the area within the bounds are actually two different transect areas, T3 neighborhood maintenance and T4 neighborhood maintenance. And the community guidelines stipulates that each category should have distinct guidelines. So in proposing an overlay that kind of straddles and encompasses both areas, I feel like it's improperly putting these guidelines on um, two different areas. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Justin Bowe. I live at 1135 Eastdale Avenue, which is inside the uh, overlay zone. Um, my wife and I actually moved here last year, uh, specifically because of Englewood. Uh, we found the homes beautiful and the neighborhood is fantastic. Uh, we had seen what's going on with some of the neighborhoods farther south uh, where they're tearing down 
older houses and putting up three, four-story buildings on uh, four, sometimes on one lot. We would be horrified if something like that happened to Englewood. Um, we're deeply invested in the community and the way it looks right now. Um, and I think it's honestly a draw for everybody coming to Nashville. Uh, I mean, we care so much we actually uh, got the uh, St. Anne's Flores Rose <laughs> that uh, was being torn down by sinkers. Um, so that's just where we stand. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right. So, commissioners, our charge this afternoon is to, um, as the staff has recommended, that these properties have made the Criterion 5, um, according to the recommendation summary, um, portion of the Jackson Park National Registry of Historic Places District, and that we would recommend um, this overlay to council. We would not make the decision to have it as an overlay, as we, I think we all understand that, but just to make sure we know our charge. Um, so, um, <laughs> will anyone make a, make a motion? Well, I think Inglewood's a beautiful neighborhood and a treasure um, for, for Nashville, and I would uh, support the recommendation to send the overlay to council. A motion. Is there a second? I just had sorry. I just had one question because sure. there were some public comments about um, specifically um, the first woman made a comment about Plymouth Avenue being a little different. When I look through the inventory grid that the uh, staff put together, it looks to me like this is one of the highest percentage of contributing that's been proposed at least since I've been on this commission. It I counted nine non-contributing out of maybe, a, what, a couple hundred? Uh, I think that's important to our, uh, to our charge and our recommendation that this is still very much an intact historical neighborhood, and those are really hard to find now. And I commend the neighborhood for getting organized early and not being reactive, because I think we've seen a lot of other neighborhoods come here with a similar project. and have already seen uh, a lot of the change they didn't want. May okay. I ask for a clarification on the motion? It, the, I heard that it was a recommendation to council, but is it also an approval of the design guidelines? Thank you. That is her motion. Good, thank you. And who has made the second? Okay. okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. That carries. Next is the Bel Air Neighborhood Landmark. This one gets a little confusing just because there are two names that are similar, uh, but this is not a historic landmark that's being requested today. This is a neighborhood landmark, which is not one of your preservation tools, it's a planning tool. But a part of that is when it includes a historic property that's listed in the National Register, you review these the proposed changes to that proposed neighborhood landmark. So that's what you're doing today. It's not like the one we just looked at. It's not a recommendation to council for approval of the neighborhood landmark, but rather uh, an approval of the work that is planned is consistent with the Secretary of Interior standards. So uh, as you saw from your packet, there's quite a bit of, of work planned. However, all of it looks to be extremely appropriate for this property. Uh, there are some, just some details that we need. So we would like to make the recommendation that um, you recommend approval of the neighborhood landmark to the planning commission with the conditions that work on the property does not continue until the following information is provided for approvals of details and materials and that preservation permits have been issued um, and building permits. Applicant provide a full scope of work for the project, including alterations, information on all new materials, including but not limited to windows, doors, cladding, trim, porch elements. Applicant provide final drawings, uh, no larger than 11 by 17 into scale for new construction, such as any additions, porches, uh, there was a new bar structure that might be a part of it, fountains, and so forth. And that the EFIS be approved as a test case only 
for non-historic portions of the building, specifically the attached garage in the left side, currently on flat addition. With these conditions, staff finds the proposal to meet the design guidelines for historic landmark, and therefore the neighborhood landmark designation meets the qualifications of 17.40.160.J, of the zoning ordinance. The council member for this district is fully in support of this neighborhood landmark, but he also was unable to be here today, but you saw there was an email in the uh, staff report showing his support. Any questions to staff? <coughs> okay. Open for public hearing. Is there anyone who would like to make comment on this project? Okay, close public hearing. Commissioners? Any discussion? Uh, you know, having grown up in Donaldson, it's delightful to see this this uh, building that's been in this location so long to really come back to life and to see uh, see positive movement. Uh, it's a beautiful structure. Uh, I'm really glad to see it uh, fall under the protection of the of this, and I move for approval. Okay. A second. Okay. There's a second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? None. Motion carries. So we're going a little out of order with the new approved agenda and we're gonna talk about the policy, uh, the DADU outbuilding policy. Most of you met on March 31st, 2017 to discuss a potential policy for outbuildings and DADUs. The policy in your packets is a policy that staff believes reflects your discussion with some additional components that have been discussed in recent years. Your request was simply to discuss today and then possibly vote on it or an amended version of it next month. As it stands, the, there's four components of this policy. Number one, continue to require that outbuildings follow the same design standards as DADUs as a way to assure that the size of outbuildings do not continue to increase and do not contrast greatly with historic buildings, out, historic outbuildings. <coughs> Exceptions may be made when unique conditions of the lot of the historic principal building dictate otherwise, such as lot dimension, shape, or grade, or the roof and dormer forms of the historic home. If implemented, this policy would serve three purposes. It'd be easier for applicants to navigate the requirements, it would assure that outbuildings approved meet the design guidelines, and it would assure that if a property owner decided at a later date to switch from an outbuilding to a DADU, the building would meet all the requirements of the ordinance. Number two, continue with the current calculation method for outbuilding DADU dormers for multiple reasons. The outbuilding currently allowed, the outbuildings currently allowed already already larger than the historic context. Changing the calculation method for a dormer to an area method rather than a linear method means that a steeper roof pitch and wider eave overhang could be utilized to increase the area, resulting in a dormer that's larger than what was originally intended. The current method already allows for more than the original method that was used. In addition, an area calculation as opposed to a linear calculation is slightly more complicated to figure and staff already receives feedback from applicants that the ordinance requirements are too difficult to understand. In fact, we heard from an architect after the last meeting, uh, we didn't ask for his opinion, but he uh, sent us an email and said that the current method is easier to calculate and is fair to all projects. Number three, set, back out, set outbuilding setbacks in RS and R zones where there are multifamily homes or, sing, or duplexes, to a five foot minimum rear setback when there are garage doors facing the alley, or three feet when there are no garage doors facing the alley. These setbacks have been routinely approved for years, and this policy would help to expedite permits and get the applicants working more quickly. And number four, add DADUs that meet all the requirements to your list of permits that can, be, that can receive an administratively issued permit into the rules of order and procedure. Any, any DADU that did not meet the requirements, of course, would still come to you. But if it's in that list, again, we're able to expedite permits more swiftly. And that is an overview of, of what we thought uh, you talked about. Um, and now it's for you to decide if you'd like to make any amendments and bring it back next month, if you'd like to wait. I will say that um, in reference to the council lady's comments, um, garages and outbuildings, are typically cookie cutter. They were historically. And what we have found is that no matter what the requirement is, that right now in our current development, everyone will build whatever form gets them the most space. So I think we'll still have cookie cutter outbuildings. Any questions for me?
Really? We have no questions. <laughs> Cyril, do you have something coming? I think it was a, a good summary of our discussion and the deliberation we went through. And I do think that uh, with respect to Councilwoman uh, Allen's request, having it introduced to this meeting and then us taking action at the next meeting will allow that uh, feedback and that uh, input from architects and community citizens uh, so that we can uh, take action on this only after we've heard from everybody that needs to weigh in. Okay, Robin, is there anything else you need from us on that? Were there any changes you'd like to make to this before it comes back to you next month? Um, are you in agreement with changing the rules of order? And then we can bring that to you next month as well. Do you feel comfortable with the way it's written? That's regarding the administrative permit? Mm -hmm. okay. That's right. Okay. okay. Is there any public discussion about this? Because this affects a lot of properties and homeowners. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Come up, please tell us your name and address, please. My name is Lynn Taylor, and I'm a residential designer, and I'm here today because I had something on a consent agenda, and I hadn't heard about this discussion about the dad and garages. You know, um, I've been told a lot of different things over the last several years since designing these. First, I was told you have to enforce the law, and they denied me a particular Dado garage. Um, and then it's like 50% of the roof, and then now it's 50% of the walls. And I've seen stuff built in the neighborhood that doesn't look like what the ordinance says. So it seems like they give some leeway on for some people. And so I don't think you all see all the email confirmation uh, back and forth between people and what they say on one project and what they tell on another project. I had a staff member tell me I had to do dimensions one way. And then the next time I saw that they made some, they let everybody else do it the way it's been done. And only after I uh, call them on it do they go back and say, oh, yeah, okay, that's the way everybody's done. And the other thing is, last year I made a uh, passionate discussion about this in July, and um, they said they hadn't changed the, uh, the rules, and they made me design the garage building after a DADU requirements. The DADU ordinance is a dwelling unit ordinance. A garage, a studio building is not a dwelling unit. And I don't think that it's legal. I've talked to two lawyers. One works for Metro, so he's very familiar with Metro. The other's a property lawyer. And they don't believe it's legal for you all, just 15 people, I don't know how many, the staff and the commissioners, to make a decision that changes base zoning for how many houses are in our districts? Over 5,000? I think Robin told me about 5,000. Okay, 10,000. You're, you're making these decisions, and these meetings need to go to the neighborhoods and let them decide what needs to happen. And they need to be explained what's going to happen about the size and square footage of the DADU. Now, several, several years ago, Michael Jamison and I went through the base zoning and got it changed from 600 square feet up to about 700 square feet because a garage that's two cars and where you want to store Time. some... Bicycles and I mean this is important what I'm saying it, it's not I'm not trying to be partial I'm just trying to explain to you what homeowners feel and a garage needs to be a certain size just to park two cars some bicycles and a lawnmower Okay, okay? thank you, you make us put a sign in the yard when we want to change base zoning when you change base zoning Nobody's being notified and I don't feel like that's legal with the government procedure set forth in Metro Okay, thank you for your comments. Are there any other ones who wants to come in now? Make a comment on this? Okay. Um, We're not making a decision today. I, that I don't think has been our uh, charge. We have just under discussion and wanted to be transparent on how we had those discussions. So and just to be clear, this is just a policy change. This is not changing the Metro Code, making a recommendation to council. This is just an internal policy discussion that we're not even voting on today. Okay. And further to that, I would say that we're, I'm not even sure I would call it a policy change. I, my feeling from the meeting a couple of weeks ago that we had on this specific issue was we were trying to make sure that we were on the same page, using the same language, and uh, communicating effectively amongst ourselves that we mean the same things. We're trying to be as consistent as, as possible. Uh, and that was the goal there to, to where's our jumping off point and I think what Robin uh, summarized that's our jumping off point I think there was consensus if not complete agreement on those 
uh, points that she described. And then now we're gonna have some more neighborhood input and before we finalize a policy. Um, but like you said, we're, we're not changing the base zoning and we're not, we're not doing much of anything other than trying to be helpful to clarify where we think we are and then we're collecting more information and we'll go from there. And, and also, um, in terms of the DADU, there was quite a few charrettes that um, the neighborhoods were involved in, and um, we're, we don't, just a moment please, and so when we're saying that, that neighborhoods did not have input on that, um, I believe that the process was uh, duly, you know, duly noted, so. And just to make you feel a little more comfortable, section 17.12.020 of the ordinance does allow you to set appropriate bulk standards. You're not actually changing them, you're setting them um, property by property of determining, by based on what's appropriate for that property. And so I just wanted you to be comfortable with that because you do that every month, um, set st uh, bulk standards. And uh, the, it was noticed on the agenda this month and I did send it to council members and to the neighborhood presidents to make sure that they were aware of it and saw it. So Robin, just as a matter of clarification, when um, Council Member Berkeley was, uh, Berkeley Allen was saying that, you know, to have more input, uh, did you have a feel of what that meant in terms of, will this go out to neighbors or what? Uh, and to those specific leaders of neighborhood. I, don't, I, I would hesitate to speak for Exactly, her, but okay. I, I don't know. Yeah, we we'll probably should get some clarification on, on what her intentions are. Yes. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, anything else, commissioners? Okay. Okay, our first project then is 402 South 11th Street. Um, this, uh, this is a continuation of a case you saw last month. I'm not gonna do the full presentation again, uh, but just to remind you that uh, it was presented last month. There was some discussion, uh, and you heard from the, the applicant, uh, and then the case was deferred uh, by the app, uh, at the request of the applicant before he made any motion. Um, just the, the quick uh, two sentence review is, was that uh, it, it, it's an application to convert an existing outbuilding to a DADU. Uh, staff found that the dormer size didn't meet the requirements of the DADU standards set forth in the ordinance, and um, therefore staff recommends disapproval of the application. Any other questions for Sean this time? Okay, thank you, Sean. Applicant, please. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Matt Schutz. I'm a local architect. And Jared Whitman, the homeowner, contacted me in February to analyze an existing garage for compliance with the detached accessory dwelling requirements of the Metro Court of Ordinances. I'm here today to provide, to provide the method and results of my analysis. I verified the accessory structure was built according to the plans, then I created a 3D model based upon the architectural drawings. I measured the area of the existing roof plane from eave to eave and the dormer's footprint from sidewall to sidewall. As evidenced by figure one in your packets, the footprint of the dormer constitutes 48% of the roof planes. I'd like to refer, refer to the diagram at this point at, in front of you and point out that the areas that we are comparing lie within the same plane. Additionally, I'd like to call attention to the operative language in the code, specifically the phrase covering no more than 50% of the roof, which you see on the bottom of the most uh, uh, farthest poster to your left. A roof, by definition, is a plane and not a line. It has width in two directions, not just one. With regard to accessory dwelling dormers, the word width doesn't exist as part of the code or guidelines. And the italicized language is not part of the code or guidelines. And it doesn't have the power to create policy or instruct the MHZC staff to act in a manner that is not supported 
by the written code or actual guidelines. I understand that staff has concerns about utilizing the area method of analysis, which you see before you on the board farthest to your right, since it is arguably more complicated than the width method of analysis. However, the area method is not without rigor, as I have demonstrated. And even if someone desired to manipulate the height or eave depth of a building, which Robin mentioned was a concern, the commission has the ability to restrict height and eave depth, regardless of use, on any accessory structure, according to the guidelines. As building professionals, we are charged with faithfully applying the language of the written code. We can recommend rules of thumb, such as the width method of analysis for dormers, but we are not generally permitted to redefine the meaning of words like roof. In special cases, the area method of analysis has been utilized previously. One example being 1214 Calvin Avenue, just a few blocks away. There in September 2015, the Metro Code, I'm sorry, the Metro Historic Zoning Commission and Metro Codes approved a detached accessory dwelling. The architect presented information to prove that the dormers occupied more than 50% of the roof width, but less than 50% of the roof area. The staff recommendation states that the width method of analysis was strongly encouraged by the commission at the end of 2015, but that was eight months after the Whitman's project was approved. Also, the encouragement of a rule of thumb does not erase the language of the existing code, and it does not change the fact that the MHCC has previously approved detached accessory dwellings based upon the area method of analysis. If the commission or staff or council wish to pursue a change in the language of the code or guidelines to prescribe the width method of analysis and consider dorm dormers only one-dimensionally, that is within their power. Uh, Ms. Allen came and spoke before you today, and if she had wanted dormers to be measured only width, they could have simply said roof width when they made this uh, change to the code. Also, since the lot at 402 South 11th Street exceeds 10,000 square feet, the code permits a larger accessory structure, footprint, or an addition to the existing house, or both. But I feel these options are less desirable from a preservation and conservation standpoint. Finally, I'd like to mention that this is a unique case in unique context which warrants unique consideration. The decision you make today does not restrict your future decisions. Any accessory structure can be permitted or denied based upon the unique context and the guidelines. Please take a look at these photos, analysis, and actual language of the code, and ask yourself as I did, for this particular parcel, is, the, is this the type of building that the code and guidelines clearly intend to restrict? Regardless of your decision today, please refer to the phrase and the actual code or guidelines used to rationalize your decision. Thank you for your consideration and your service to the city. Um, the homeowner, uh, Jared Whitman, is behind me, may have a few words to say um, as well. And for the remainder of our time, we'd like to reserve that for questions for the commissioners and uh, responses to additional staff comments. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, I would be okay with, if I could, reserve the rest of our time while you guys discuss if we could have anything to say to that, if that's possible. Actually, to clarify that your um, rebuttal time is for public comment, not rebuttal of the uh, commissioner's discussion. I, I guess our thought was that sometimes during the discussion there are additional staff comments that we may want to respond to. My name is Regina T uh, Lynn Taylor, uh, residential designer, and um, I believe the commission has approved a couple of my dadu from the roof slope in the beginning. That was how they calculated it. And then at some point, they decided the wall, like Matt had stated. Okay, thank you. Are there any others from the public? I would like to just say one thing, um, and that's that when we were in the process of having this approved and going back and forth with Sean, the exact phrase, 50% of the roof area, was said by Sean to us. That's where we came up with that from the very beginning. It was in an email sent to us where it was specifically said 50% of the roof area. Now, if they're trying to say that they use 50% of the roof area for outbuildings and 50% of the width for day dues, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. We were told 50% of the roof area, and we also told them that we eventually wanted to use this as a finished living space, so. OK, 
Okay. Discussion? I think all the issues here are things that we discussed in more general terms in our meeting a couple of weeks ago and just recently before this application here today. I think the, the argument that um, we ought to be making the measurement based on area is a good and completely reasonable and logical argument. So is the width one. And we need to get more community input and figure out where we're going to land on this. Looking at the language, it says, by covering no more than 50% of the roof, the applicant's architect made a good um, argument that it, if they meant width, they should have said 50% of the roof width. But I think it's also a fair argument that if they meant area, they should have said 50% of the roof area. So the statute we have is, is vague. And we have done our best to try to be consistent and fair, and it clearly has not been perfect in administration of that um, by this commission. So we, we're trying to be fair, and we want to be fair, um, and, but it seems like there's some, some clarity we need from some future discussion. But in the meantime, to me, we ought to follow what we talked about a couple weeks ago and remain as consistent as we can be until we decide we are absolutely making a change. Otherwise, we're just creating more problems and treating people differently. We want to, of course, minimize the situations where people feel they're being treated differently. So clearly you're saying to be consistent of what has been approved in the past because well, we do have this. It, it's hard because there's a, at least one example where it appears that the roof area calculation was the analysis. I think that's an outlier. If that's the case, that's an outlier. And that at least for the last couple of years, they've, we've been consistent and staff has been consistent with width. Um, so I don't see any reason to change that and unless we are in fact going to make a change, which requires a lot more discussion and a lot more public input, because we may go well beyond just saying, well, it's not width anymore, it's area. Well, there could be a whole lot of other stuff in this uh, statute and the guidelines that we need to revisit or that is gonna change. So in the meantime, I think it makes a lot of sense to try to remain as consistent as we can, which would be the width calculation. You, you know, on this project, there is a preponderance of evidence that we've been presented and have been able to go through and read. And I think it's clear from that evidence that both the homeowner and the staff were really working uh, diligently to try to conform to the regulations. And, and this does bring up the problem that we do have of a different standard for, uh, for garages and for uh, residential units. And so uh, this project has, has obviously clarified for us a whole lot of the discrepancy between those codes and brought us to the point of trying to bring those together, sync them up so that we won't have this ca same kind of confusion that Ms. Taylor has talked about in her comments today. Um, I, I do think that uh, having been by this property, seen what's there, uh, seen all the language that's come forth in the evidence, I think it is a unique situation. I do think that since we're on the verge of possibly within a month uh, clarifying this that uh, I think it would be judicious of this body to go ahead and approve this project uh, based on the diligence of both staff and the owner in trying to get to the right place with it, uh, with the understanding that we will be clarifying and revising the policy uh, next month. Caitlin and Elizabeth. I, just, I say with respect to the last comments the homeowner made, we have several emails provided to us in our packet that I read through, um, none of which to me, I've, none of which have said specifically staff saying roof area, um, number one. Number two, um, finished space and living space are two different things. You can have a finished space, you store things, you can have a finished space um, that's finished, it's drywalled, but it's not a living space, which is the difference between an outbuilding and a dadu. Um, so I think in all these emails I see finished space, 
regarding from staff comments, never is it said living space and staff quite plainly always pointed out that, um, you know, those are two different things uh, with different rules. So that's just, those are my comments on just a few of the last homeowner's comments as I was reading through the emails um, before the meeting and now. Um, and I just worry about changing for this one project, um, you know, how we've been doing it now since we changed it with Commissioner G, not we, I was not here, but since it was changed under Commissioner G, um, how we, how we measure and how it is um, communicated. So that's my comment. Elizabeth. Well, I'm a little bit confused. So when you first brought this to this, this body, it was not meant to be a living space. And now, is that, is that correct? When, um, and Jared may be able to comment on this as well. When he first contacted uh, staff, he said he did intend it as a living space eventually, but not at the moment that it was approved. And so he went through several back and forth emails with Sean, and that's where, um, the roof area uh, term was emailed back to Jared. Um, and so he actually made the dormer smaller than it was origi originally proposed to try and make sure that he was down in the 50% of roof area, knowing that in the future he would have to apply for an additional permit through codes to make it living space above. But that was something that was expressed to staff in the initial email conversation. Okay. And it, it should be in that first email that we sent. Um, and also to your point, what you were saying about the living space difference. Um, so in the discussion, I believe around November, we submitted plans that had uh, a setback for the roof that was uh, no setback on the eaves and just, uh, I think, two feet on the ends. And that's when Sean wrote back and said, you know, uh, this is okay, except you need a two foot setback on the eave. And he said, I believe something to the effect of, I re would recommend making the uh, setback on the, uh, on, the set, on the ends more as well if you intend to either use it, I don't know if he said finished space or living space. And he said, if not, generally that doesn't need to be done. So then to me, if we're saying that he wasn't referring to living space, we're talking that there's a different set of rules for an outbuilding with just just uh, studs upstairs, a different one for finished space that has drywall, and a different one for living space. And I don't think that that's what he meant. So when we were having a discussion between, these are the general rule of thumb guidelines for finished space, I took that to mean living space. And that's what we tried to adhere to. And that's why we uh, revised our plans again to set it in another two feet, so it's four feet and two feet off the eaves. Okay, let's, Commissioner, still further discussion here. Uh, I, I think, I've read all the emails too, um, and I don't think it, it uh, that those emails after reading them cast any blame either way. I think that clearly there was confusion. Um, and I think it's also important that when the applicant picked up their permit, they signed a restrictive covenant that says you cannot use this as, as living space. That probably should have put off a bell um, if, if they in fact wanted to use it as living space. But I, I also think the process is confusing and codes is confusing and, and that it happens. Um, but I, all of that is really neither here nor there. I mean, what we have in front of us is this situation um, and how we're going to administer it going forward. I, I'm not sure this is this situation is all that unique. I think we have a lot of outbuildings that have been built in a way that complied that we said complied with the guidelines, but didn't comply with the DADU statute, which is much more specific. If if we approve this one to be converted, I don't see how we can argue that all those other people can't come back next month and say, I want the same thing. Personally, that doesn't bother me in the least bit. I think it's silly that we have to even be talking about use. I don't care what someone does in the upper half of their garage, but we've got this statute that's very specific and then we have guidelines that are 
somewhat vague. I wish we didn't have to be in the middle of this and be trying to figure it out, but um, I still keep coming back to it, and I'm not sure it's the fairest thing for this applicant, but I think the fairest thing overall is to try to remain consistent with what we discussed two weeks ago, have those uh, discussions, more discussions publicly, and be satisfied that everybody's had their input, and then try to come up with some change in policy that everybody feels is somewhere near consensus. But if we approve this today, we're just changing course a little bit again. And if we continue to just keep doing that till we get, uh, it just doesn't seem like the right way to treat all the other people. I think on the balance, the fairest thing to do is to continue with width as the calculation. And I, I feel for the applicant, I'd be mad if I were them too. It, does, it doesn't, it's not fair to them, but on the balance, I think it's the fairest thing uh, to try to be consistent. Okay. So, is there a motion? Aaron, can you want to draft one? If you don't mind, I can say just one more thing to what you said about the restrictive covenant form. Um, That's up to your, your do, do we have minutes for rebuttal? They can't rebuttal our conversation. Commissioner, what do you, would you like to hear another sure. comment? I think it's okay. okay. This, uh, that did throw up actually a red flag when we had to sign that, and we asked to have that explained to us from our general contractor, and he's, he explained it that basically we were, he took that to mean we are saying we promise not to finish this without coming back to you to get permits. You are not going to suddenly see a living space up there someday, and we didn't come back to you to get the right permits, is how we took that to say this space up here all of it, top and bottom, is not today going forward going to be used as living space unless we come back to you and do things the right way and get permits from you. That was how we took it when we when we submitted it. So, and I think that's a perfectly reasonable conclusion. The the process is confusing and we need to get it fixed. Um, it's a matter of how we treat this applicant and trying to be fair to all the other applicants who have been told no. And what we're going to deal with if we say yes here i think we have to say yes to all the other ones and i don't know how many there are but i, I feel like there could be a lot i'm i'm fairly new to this commission but it, it seems like that the rules that we have for these zoning overlays in our communities is to make building structures look not out of character with the historic guidelines that we have. And so driving by, I don't, it doesn't matter if somebody's living there or not, the structure from the outside still looks the same. And so that's the problem that I have with different rules for outbuildings and different rules for daddies. Why? I'm driving by, I'm looking at the neighborhood. It does, just doesn't make sense to me. I can answer that question. Um, it, when this started, um, a second unit was not allowed to be detached. You had to have two units attached. And so that's when you started to see a lot of those homes with the weird connection <coughs> between. And, and obviously those would not be approved in historic overlay because that's not a form you see. So people had to, the only option was to have a second unit attached to the back. So there was some interest in having small apartments in towards the back of the lot as opposed to attached to the house. But there was a lot of fear of that too, that that would increase density in the neighborhoods in a manner that people didn't want. So our director worked very closely with the neighborhoods, with the planning department and with the council members to come up with something that would allow for that use that wouldn't otherwise be allowed and that the, the neighborhoods would still be comfortable with. So they started out much smaller than they are now, and the ordinance has since changed to allow the footprint to be a little bit bigger. The dormer setbacks were important to keep those buildings from looking like a true full two-story. Uh, it was to try to keep them small. That's the reason for the 700 square feet living space, which is something you wouldn't normally look at. But that was the reason behind all of it. it was, that is what the neighborhoods and the council members and the planning department all agreed to. And so that's why we've tried so hard to, to maintain that and, and keep those regulations 
because that is what everyone's agreed to. Yeah, I think the issue is there, there's broader policy considerations and planning that have put us in this situation. We have, but that's the, the hand that we've been dealt. It goes outside of our guidelines in terms of this statute is, is a unique situation for us where we um, we aren't setting the bulk standards. We're, we're actually, uh, they're dictated to us. Okay, we are still going to make a motion, someone. <laughs> it's a tough one. And again, I think I'm gonna echo what Cyril has said, is that both um, staff and the applicant have put their best foot forward and have given uh, reasonable um, uh, arguments, And but we are in a difficult situation as a uh, board. So just acknowledge that and uh, keep focused that we do have this particular project to vote on and that we, I know we always say don't pre set precedents, but we are in a very precarious position because if we do one or the other, you know, but let's, let's stick to the, uh, the, the guidelines that we know is what I would um, recommend. Okay. So, so I may not get a second to this motion, but, um, <laughs> but, but my sense is that, that we are working to clarify this issue. This project has been caught between the crosshairs and um, the, uh, in, in what we're dealing with is uh, an, an overall charge of preserving what these guidelines and neighborhoods have asked us to preserve for them. Uh, I don't see how this particular situation jeopardizes that. And so my motion is to approve um, uh, this, uh, this particular application. There is a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay, there's a second. Uh, Can I ask a question before I get clarification? Um, since there's a motion and there's a second, if it passes, there will be a time period before a policy is approved. Do you, how will you want us to approach all those projects between now and then? Well, let's, let's see where, where, let's we, see where we take where we land. So you, we have five. It takes four for a quorum. It takes four for, so there must be four concurring votes concurring in order votes. for the motion to pass. So I, I will probably have to vote. Okay, so we have a second, yes. Can we have very quick further discussion? Okay. okay. My, my question is for legal. Um, if, if this motion does not pass, and then the opposite motion is made and does not pass, and we can't get to four, we're just gridlocked, and if we don't act within 30 days, the project is approved? So it'll be approved if, if you don't have four concurring votes one way or the other. Okay. Sounds like that's the way it's gonna be. Well, and I don't know that that's a bad result. We're not setting a precedent, but this person <laughs> gets what they want. <clears throat> and I'm not saying I'm pushing us towards that, but I won't be upset if it happens. So we have a, a, a first and a, a second. So all in favor, all opposed. Aye. Okay, so there's two for and two, two against. I'll make a motion to disapprove based on staff recommendation. There is a motion. Who seconds? Seconded. Okay. All in favor of that motion and all opposed. Okay. So we are at a grid. And, and it wouldn't matter if I voted or not because we don't have four concurring votes. Well, Okay, we have not been in this position before, I, so bear with us, public. <laughs> I, I personally think we just stumbled into a good result and should just move on. 
Unless legal thinks we need to continue to legal? debate. Legal? Is there anything? There's, there's not really much else you can do. I there's think been we, a motion for approval and a motion for disapproval. Both have failed. failed. You have to have four concurring votes for a motion to pass. If there's not another motion on the table, um, then this would just be approved by default. Okay. That's Without a first. Without precedent. <laughs> Without precedence. <laughs> Do we all understand that? Yeah, I, can, I think we all understand that, right? <laughs> okay. Thank you all. Thank you for your patience. All right. Let's move on to 409 Broadway, please. Good afternoon, 409 Broadway, the former Lawrence Brothers Record Shop, now in Evie's Honky Tonk. This is an application for a rooftop addition and also to address uh, a, uh, a modification for this existing projecting sign for uh, chasing and flashing lights. The addition, these are the side uh, and front elevation, um, has a shed roof, as you see in the front there, sloping from left to right which is 10 feet above the parapet wall at its highest point. The front wall of the addition, uh, it's small there, but the wall itself is 42 feet away from the front wall of the building. Um, the front edge of its overhang is 30 feet away. These meet the uh, design guidelines for the location of the addition, how far it's uh, set back from the, the front of the building. Um, so it meets the design guidelines for height and scale and location. There are a few materials in question and staff uh, has recommended approval of those um, as a condition of, uh, of a recommendation for approval. Um, as well as making sure that the uh, step back area between the front of the building and the addition is not used for any permanent features such as lighting, um, speakers or signage. That's a standard um, feature. The sign uh, was approved administratively in November last year as it met the design guidelines. Um, it has since had chas chasing and flash flashing lights um, activated on it. Uh, as the commission has recently approved moving lighting when it is not on an overwhelming area of a sign, uh, staff recommends approval of the modification for chasing and flashing lights. So in conclusion, staff recommends approval of the rooftop addition with the conditions that metal color, texture, and material of the posts are approved by staff and that the area in front of the addition will have no permanent features. And staff recommends approval of the, uh, the modification to signage with the condition that the duration of the chasing and flashing is adjusted to no less than one second. I think it's a quicker uh, motion currently. That concludes my presentation. Thank you, Paul. Is the applicant here? Yes. Okay, please come forward. I'm Sarah Milkey. I'm with Remick Moore Architect. Um, representing duties. Um, everything that um, was just said, um, the flashing lights on the sign, we are working to modify them. The parts have been ordered. Um, there's going to be a transformer that needs to be changed out. So as soon as those parts are in, the sign will be modified. So you're in agreement with the staff recommendation. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. Open for public comments, anyone? Okay, close public hearing. Commissioners, any motion? I, I move for approval of uh, 409 Broadway based on staff recommendations. Is there a second? Second. Second. So one, one question on, for discussion. Mm -hmm. is, is the one second, is that the quickest frequency we've allowed in the past? I, mean, I know we, we make sure that it has to pause for the, to try to avoid the overwhelming Yes, Concerned. that's correct. Okay, thanks. Okay, there's a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, any opposed? None. The motion carries. Okay, that was easy. 116 3rd Avenue South. And 
This is more signage, uh, an application at, um, at this property for signage that has been installed um, previously without permit. Uh, painted signage, which you can see here underneath the windows, which I understand was actually a, a decal. We've called it painted signage, and um, our understanding is that it's been removed. Uh, great. Um, so that's actually already been addressed. The um, ice cream cone sign here uh, is installed currently, um, uh, projecting sign also with a modification for uh, chasing lighting. Um, the allocation of sign area for this building is 82 square feet of signage in total. The uh, current existing signage is 45 feet for the, uh, the large painted sign uh, above the windows. Uh, the permitted projecting sign to the left is 16 square feet, and the uh, projecting sign in question, uh, unpermitted, is 13 square feet. Uh, so since the lower signage has been uh, removed already, the building is under their allotment at 74 square feet. The new projecting sign meets the design guidelines for size, for location. Uh, it has neon lettering and exposed bare bulb uh, lights uh, in the middle of the sign. The commission has approved motion previously, uh, but bare bulbs are a prohibited light source under the illumination section of the design guidelines. So although the applicant has removed the painted signage, uh, the building's under their allotment, um, and the applicant has, um, has addressed the, uh, the previous unpermitted uh, painted signage, uh, staff recommends disapproval of the projecting sign based on the bare bulbs, uh, which have not been permitted in the past. And the applicant is here to discuss with you some options for it. Thank you, Paul. Paul, so is, is your recommendation changing because they removed? No, sir. Um, the Our recommendation is still for disapproval, mainly because of the bare bulbs. Although okay. the, the sign area is no longer in question, um, it's, uh, it's my understanding that the commission has not approved bare bulbs on a sign okay. previously. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, in discussions with uh, Paul uh, recently on the, um, the sign itself there, um, we're in agreement that the bare bulbs issue, we, we do need to take that into account. Um, and are certainly looking at um, how we can um, line up with the, the regulations as they need to be. So that's, uh, we're in total agreement with that. Um, the way that we would um, attend to that would be using clear perspex over those sections there so that the bulbs would not be exposed to the elements at all and that would provide a barrier uh, to that and they can be easily manufactured and installed onto the sign itself. Staff, is that, is that under requirement staff that's within line? That has been something that's been proposed in the past and disapproved. But as you know, there is a meeting coming up next month for you to discuss building illumination and, and this issue, b bare bulbs in the district. So knowing that and knowing that, again, your policy may change as more research is found um, and discussed, we recommend, the um, recommendation was that the applicant, disapproval and that the applicant have 30 days to correct the violation. And we suggest disapproval and 90 days to correct the violation. That gives you time to talk about it, and if the policy should change, then it's all fine, and it just goes away. Um, if not, then it would they would have 90 days to correct it. Okay, so let's clarify that. Under recommendation summary, then that last, sen last sentence would be 90 days. We would have to put that in our motion. And I would, and I would take out that <laughs> section of the motion that talks about allotment, since that's been corrected. So. Staff recommends disapproval of the signage because it does not meet section four of the design guidelines for signage. Specifically, the ice cream cone sign features a prohibited light source. Staff further recommends that the applicant is provided 90 days to correct the violation. Okay. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, applicant. Right. Thank you. Um, anyone public hearing to make comment? All right, close public hearing. Discussion? It sound, sounds like there's been good discussion between the staff and the applicant. Uh, I move for um, approval of the motion that Robin just stated. Is that clear enough then, Robin? <laughs> yes. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? None. The motion carries. 
We are at 144 Windsor. Uh, 532nd Avenue has been deferred by the applicant, just for the record. Oh, there we are. So 144 Windsor Drive uh, is a non-contributing house in the uh, Bellmead Links Triangle Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. It's non-contributing because it was constructed in 1991. Uh, the house was, uh, well, I'll show you a map here. So it's a triangle neighborhood and this property, non-contributing, uh, is backs up to the edge of the overlay uh, and houses behind it uh, obviously are not, not under the conservation zoning overlay. Uh, the house was enlarged with a rear addition in 2011 uh, approved by the Historic Zoning Commission. The addition essentially fills the entire rear yard uh, from side setback to side setback and uh, to 10 feet from the rear of the property with uh, something akin to a, uh, a piazza with a courtyard in the center. Uh, the, uh, the walls of the addition are 17 foot feet tall um, and the chimney on the very rear uh, of the, to the right of the upper image uh, was not constructed, so it's just essentially the, the walled courtyard. Um, there is habitable living space uh, within the, the courtyard area as well, but the center area is, is just uh, unroofed, without roof. Um, so what we're here today is uh, a, a structure has been a construct a new structure in addition has been constructed on top of the addition that was approved in 2011. Uh, the addition, what's been added, consists of metal poles, like metal fence poles with a mesh or netting suspended between them. The, um, you can see it here, this is a view from the street and uh, at the, the back uh, to the right side of that picture is uh, the netting that's been uh, hung on poles uh, attached to the top of the addition. Uh, the intention, we're told, is to allow greenery to grow on the mesh, creating a screen wall. Um, I think of it as kind of like the fence around a driving range or batting cage, something like that. Uh, currently, there are some banners that have been hung up on the between the poles and on the netting. Um, they're, they're not Good, that's, uh, well, it, regardless, actually, the, the banners are, are not the concern of this commission anyway, uh, and neither would be the, the greenery. Really, just the, the concern, uh, the direct concern, uh, would be the structure that's been, that's been built. Uh, the options would, of course, be to uh, either remove the unpermitted structure or to seek MHCC approval and then get building permits. Um, so, I think I have another picture there. Um, it's an unusual situation, but it's a non-contributing house at the, uh, non-contributing house and a large addition on the rear and the poles have been added on the rear. The house backs up to uh, the edge of the overlay. Uh, it's not certainly a common situation. Um, staff recommends approval after the fact of the rooftop addition because of the unique conditions of the project. And the applicant or the owner is here if you have any questions. Do you have any questions for Sean? I, I do, Sean. How tall are the poles above the 17 foot wall? Uh, they add eight feet to the height of the structure at the rear. Uh, I believe the sides are a little shorter, uh, maybe four or five feet. Okay. Um, you'll be, are you the applicant? Okay, um, I think you are welcome to come to the podium and speak. Um, G give us your name and oh, your address, sorry. please. I'm Jackie Daniel and I'm property owner at 144 Windsor Drive. Um, 
the rear of the property that those um, banners um, face, um, it's a new construction that's 45 feet tall that overlooks the entire neighborhood with a flat roof. So you can see in the backyards of people's homes um, within you know the entire block of all, in all areas. And, um, and that's a different ordeal, but the, um, it, it's not netting actually, it's trellis um, and the design, so it's very different from what would be around a golf course. It's um, the intention and what's not there yet um, that gets shipped Friday are custom window boxes which will hang on the ends, uh, planter boxes which will hang on the inside of that parapet wall. Um, what you can't see from the photograph is that the um, post, they're just posts, they're not meant to be structural. They're, they were um, put, they've been there for actually a while, several years, um, just to hang string lights and things because the surrounding wall is a parapet wall and there's a green grass roof where my kids play. So that's what that structure is. And um, also on the second level, that new construction looks into the entire back of my house, which is a lot, there's a lot of glass in my daughter's bedrooms. And it's been a tremendous, and this home has been a tremendous invasion of privacy throughout the neighborhood. Um, there's a hundred signs around the neighborhood about this project because they cut all the trees down. We no longer have a treescape, treescape and nobody has any privacy anymore. So the intention is hopefully in a few years enough of vines will grow up the trellis so that we can get some sort of privacy back, but also the neighbors will hopefully, they'll get a better view because they'll see green as opposed to the top of that house, which is not harmonious with the other homes constructed in, in our neighborhood. So, and in the neighborhood where it is as well. Um, but, it's not meant to be structural, it's not meant to, you know, it's simply a trellis. Ms. Daniel, you're saying that this picture here, this is not your home, this is your neighbor? No, that, that is my house. What you see in the back is the, um, is the new construction. It's built very close to my house. Okay. It's literally and, 10 feet away. And the house behind that is your neighbor? The house to which direction? Um, the, yeah. ho the house, the, the, that house Behind. in the picture is mine, but the one you see in the background is the that taller, new construction. The taller building. Yes. Okay. And then the, the neighbors on but that, this side, <laughs> but the, like I'm pointing over here, the one that you can't really see where the um, lacrosse net is right there, that is, um, they have, it's new construction, so they have actually, you would never have been able to see that from the street, but they've torn down trees, but they're replanting trees um, shortly. They're just at the, they haven't gotten to the landscaping phase of their construction project yet. So you shouldn't be able to see, and I'm also intending to plant more trees myself around the perimeter and to help kind of get the privacy back in the greenscape. Okay, thank you very much. Public hearing, anyone want to comment? Okay, close public hearing, discussion. This is um, this is another difficult issue. I mean, we have several difficult issues today, but this is another difficult one. And and clearly, what's happening on the adjacent lots is is not wonderful. Um, I mean, it's you know the, the neighborhood is up in outrage about what's being built outside the conservation zoning overlay, something that the overlays are designed to to prevent. I, I do think that that putting you know, an eight foot green wall on top of an already 17 foot tall wall, uh, you know, given that the surrounding is not uh, um, the same thing that this neighborhood has historically been, given the height of those walls, is, um, is still pretty excessive. And one of the things that is a big part of our conservation overlay and guidelines is the scale and proportion of the homes. Uh, part of the hardship that's presented here is was created by the homeowner when they applied for a 10-foot setback versus a 20-foot setback. And so they've limited the amount of landscaping area in the back of the yard. Um, uh, you know, with this being put up without a permit, I, I'm not as sympathetic. Uh, and um, I, I think that the neighborhood has a lot to be concerned about, but I'm not so sure that approving this sets the right uh, standard for what we as a, as a commission are set to do. Can, can I say one more thing? Okay. Thank you. M 
my concern is not so much with this project and um, this particular result, if it was approved, but um, thinking about all the flat roofs we have that we've already approved um, and what we put applicants through on Broadway to minimize those walls and what people have done to try to comply with the screening rules and other things uh, on flat roofs. And I'm guessing we have a lot of them, not commercial and residential, that um, this type of situation applied elsewhere would be very problematic. And we, if, if, if we do approve it in this instance, we have to be very, very, very particular about why this is truly unique because it, I think the precedent would be a gigantic can of worms if we're not careful. <clears throat> and whether it's vegetation or not, it, it, the, the, massing, uh, the massing and the perception of it will be substantial. Since the applicant wants to come back, can would you like to have a few more minutes or so? Minute. <laughs> um, I wanted to address your concern about not applying for a permit because I was very, very careful <laughs> this time around. I went to. Um, I actually came down here. I went to talk to Byron Hall, the head of the Metro Codes. Um, we discussed this in detail, and he said it would be no problem. The only reason I didn't consult Historic is because of all the permits and things that I've done um, have been to the rear of the house, and they have not required historicals approval on them. Um, it was not it was not intentional at all. Um, I just you know I, I asked him specific questions. I did not bypass not applying for a permit. I want to assure you of that. But also, what you may not see on the drawing is that. The reason, I mean, we, we, did, a, we did get an um, allowance for the setback, and the reason for that is in between, that's actually the side of that home, but in between there's a, there's a um, sewage easement. So until that was constructed, there was a big massive tree line and a sewage easement, and you didn't see, you didn't see our house. So it's not a situation where we're, you know, we're, facing the front of the street or, you know, it's, it's definitely the rear of the home. But these people, um, the developers, took this three tall and skinny houses on this tiny little um, street. They took all the trees and they butchered them. And they have no intention of putting them back. And it was, you know, it definitely is one of the, you know, it's, it, it's ruined my sense of privacy, it's ruined all of our neighbors' sense of, sense of privacy. And the only way we're going to get it back is, is with um, plan, plantings. And they're not intending to plant, so it's really, you know, it just, it, it's barren. And from our beautiful historic neighborhood, you see, um, I've got pictures of the streetscape that you see. You see this looming tower peering back. So we are all, you know, going to be planting trees, but it's going to take years for them to get tall enough. This thing is 45 feet tall. So, um, you know, if, if I can't, I mean, it, it's the most tasteful way I feel to, um, to do this, but also, you know, even though it looks like I've taken a big lot, I mean, it's the whole roof up at the top is grass on that, on that parapet wall. And then, of course, that's all open space. That's not conditioned space in the courtyard. It's an open room underneath it, open air room. So I'm not... I didn't build, you know, uh, it's, you know, it was all built with the attention of, of the outdoors. So, um, you know, I just, I, I, there's no way to get privacy back unless, and I do it. And my daughter's bedrooms are on that second floor and you can just see straight in them. And I've got, you know, I've got pictures of anybody's interested with me that, that shows the perspective from the third floor of that house. Would you all care to see them? Okay. Does anyone have any other questions for the applicant? 
Um, it's noted in our notes that um, on April 3rd, <laughs> the codes department actually notified Metro Historic Zoning Commission staff that construction was taking place without a building per without a building permit permit or a preservation permit. Well, that is probably a result of the developer. Um, um, that there have been a lot of those notices from my house from the developer. Um, I mean, I can only assume because they are very agitated by um, the signs and the hundred signs that are in currently in people's yards, but also from the, the signage that I put in the back of my house. Um, and, you know, I know that that, that you know, that is, um, I mean, it is a very long involved story with this developer that the, the entire, I mean, if you drive around those houses, 95% have the sign in their yard. This is a very, it's a, it's a huge deal <laughs> in the neighborhood that they were allowed to do this. Um, people, you know, it, these were just sweet little neighborhoods with conservatives. I mean, this was a one story, probably 1,500 square foot ranch top that was torn down in these three tall and skinny houses built. Um, they have single car garages and they're three and four bedroom. And, you know, the kids can no longer play in the streets because it's so dangerous because the car, you know, and the streets are not even two lane wide back there. So it's been very controversial and I have been very, um, you know, very upset by it. And, um, you know, I'm, I mean, I think that's a separate issue as far as, but I think that has stirred up a lot of, a lot of um, what they're trying to accomplish is making life, di life difficult for me. And um, I don't think that the, as I said, I, I did go to Byron Hall and talk to him um, about it, so. Thank you. Okay. All right, um, further discussion. A motion. Okay. Any clarification that we need? No? I'd be upset if this happened to me too. Um, but as I sit here and think about it more, I think there's probably thousands of people that have a gigantic house built on near the property line next to them. Um, I'm more concerned with precedent going forward and flat roofs and how we would be able to tell other people they couldn't do this in a lot of other places. And in terms of, of massing, you already have a 17 foot straight wall and adding, so you'd have a 25 foot wall uh, it's actually a structure. It's not a wall. I'm talking about the uh, perception of it, uh, the massing. It'd be uh, opaque. And so um, I don't think that that is the result we want. It's largely hidden here, so maybe that's part of something that can make it okay. But uh, we'd have a big problem if... if it proliferated. <laughs> okay. Aaron, do you want to craft a motion? Yeah, the only thing I would see for maybe, you know, in fear of creating a precedent for all the flat roofs was is just that it it's in the back. It is backing up to I think it wouldn't be an issue, you know, if this was backing up to, if it was in the middle of the historic zone, you know, and the, it was backing up to historic house, it would be no question to me. Um, just the fact that the massing and it, it, it will appear to be a, however, you know, what did you say, a 25 story foot wall, you know, from the back. But since it is, if you're back there, you're not in the historic district. That's the only thing for me that would be a case for not creating the precedent for us. Um, it does have two people on each side, though, that are in the historic overlay that... Um, but they are glad I'm doing it. it. 
Excuse, let us. Okay, yeah. sorry. We, we're, we're closing public hearing. I'm sorry, Ms. Daniel. Sorry, I don't know yeah. the rules. No, no I'm sorry. Worries. Thank you, though. Okay. I mean, what's, what stops someone from coming in and, and wanting to do a flat roof outbuilding and then coming back and putting an eight foot wall on top of it? I think that the perceived massing of that would be much larger than anything that we would approve if it was. Um, if it was building rather than uh, vegetation, but it would have the same impact to, to people around them. And that's the precedent I'm worried about, or the opportunity I'm worried about. And to, to me, the applicable section of the guidelines the neighbors approved and, and was approved through the process was 2B1 new, for new construction uh, and uh, section B scale, the size of a new building and its mass in relation to open spaces shall be compatible by not contrasting greatly with surrounding historic buildings. And I think that this, this project is one that will contrast greatly and having driven by there and around the back streets and everything else, uh, I think just because the just because that precept has been violated by the new buildings being built out of the conservation overlay, it doesn't necessarily justify uh, violating it with this specific performance. So ba based on that, uh, I, I will make a motion to recommend disapproval. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay, we have one opposed. Okay, I will vote for disapproval. And the motion carries. Seventeen oh seven Blair Boulevard. Seventeen oh seven Blair Boulevard is a two and a half story house constructed circa 1915, it contributes to the historic character of the Belmont Hillsboro Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. This site is zoned RM20. Based on the zoning and the size of the lot, up to five dwelling units are allowed under code. The applicant is proposing to construct a rear addition to the historic house and to construct a rear building behind the principal structure. The rear structure requires a rear setback determination. There will be two residential units in the historic house, one unit in the addition, and two units in the rear building. While the Metro Historic Zoning Commission does not regulate the number of units allowed on the site and does not regulate use, it can determine whether or not the proposed design, height, and scale of the construction on the site is appropriate to the historic house, the lot, and the overall Belmont Hillsboro Neighborhood cons Conservation Zoning Overlay. In this case, staff is recommending disapproval of the project, finding that its height, scale, and roof form are not in keeping with the historic character of the immediate context. A little bit more about the immediate context. The immediate context is primarily single family houses, many of which are also zoned RM20. The block is bookended with large multifamily buildings on the corners, but the interior of the block currently maintains the historic single family form. Based on the fact that the majority of the lots in the immediate vicinity are similar in size with similar house forms and zoning, any approval for this property will likely set a precedent for the 10 other similar lots on the block. Here are some photos of the context before I go on into describing the project in more detail. The top photo is the house, the historic house to the right of the house in question. The middle photo is, um, there's a side alley that abuts 1707 Blair, or, yeah, 1707 Blair, and then on the other side of that is that one and a half story bungalow you see, and then on the other side of that is, um, also on the bottom photo. It's the corner of Belmont and Blair Boulevard. It is a multifamily development that was approved by the commission in 2015. Here are some photos of the um, streetscape across the street. Um, the top photo does show a historic multifamily structure. I'm not sure how many units are in that structure, but it is. it looks like it was constructed as a multifamily structure. And then the, most of the other houses are single family houses across the street. So again, here's the overall site plan uh, in the side elevation. The addition will have a footprint of 1,306 square feet, and the rear structure will have a footprint of 1,891 square feet. Overall, staff finds that the size of the addition and the rear structure overwhelm the historic house and are, 
are out of scale. So first I'm gonna talk about the addition in detail. The addition you can see here in the bottom image is two foot four inches taller than the historic house. So the design guidelines do allow for additions to be taller than the historic house if the house is a single story structure. So you can see there in the text it says um, the only option additions to the single story structures may rise as high as four feet above the shadow line in the existing building. The intent of this portion of the design guidelines is to allow for a reasonable upper level space for those houses that are particularly short, one story, where it's difficult to kind of get um, adequate space on a second level. Staff finds it is not appropriate for an addition behind a two and a half story house to be taller than the historic house, particularly when there are no other severe lot constraints. So here's the front facade. Um, you can see that the, again here that the addition is taller than the historic house. Uh, and here are the two side facades. The brick part of the addition will have a flat roof form. Staff finds that a flat roof form could be appropriate if the top of the roof is no taller than the historic house's eave height. In this case, the top of the flat roof is a foot taller than the top of the house's eaves. Above the flat roof will be a tall dormer that contains access to a balcony above the second story. The balcony includes a wall barrier that is three feet six inches above the flat roof. Because the flat roofs are taller than the historic house's eaves and because they are paired with larger dormers and three foot six inch balcony barriers, staff finds that the roof form is not appropriate. The dormers on the addition, which meet the ridge high of the roof and the balconies above the second story level, further serve to accentuate the addition's height. Uh, now back to the rear structure. Um, the rear structure is three stories and has a footprint of 1,891 square feet. The proposed building in the rear is not an outbuilding in the traditional sense. It is not an accessory structure to the historic house, but rather a separate building with two dwelling units that have three bedrooms and three and a half baths each in it. Because the lot is zoned RM20, the rear building is not restricted by the regulations of DADUs. Um, in this case, the Historic Zoning Commission needs to determine whether the design, height, scale of the rear building whether those things are appropriate to the historic house, the site, and the overall historic neighborhood. Staff finds that the rear structure's height and scale are not appropriate to the historic site and immediate context. One issue is that there's only 15 feet, eight inches between the back of the addition and the outbuilding. The commission typically requires a space of at least 20 feet between the primary and the rear structures. And in this case, because the rear structure is so large, we would probably recommend that even more space be, um, even more than 20 feet would be appropriate. For traditional outbuilding, the design guidelines limit the footprints of outbuildings to 1,000 square feet when a lot is more than 10,000 square feet, and this lot is more than 10,000 square feet. Because the lot is zoned RM20, staffs find that it could be appropriate for an exception to be made to this 1,000 square foot um, typical guideline. However, staff finds that the, um, the footprint, which is almost 1,900 square feet, is too large for the site. Um, in addition, staff finds that the outbuilding is its height is inappropriate. It's the same height as the historic house, but um, as you can see in the diagram that because the lot slopes up, it actually sits higher on the structure um, and its three story form is larger than the two and a half story form of the historic house. So we find that to be inappropriate. So um, here are the elevations for the outbuilding. Um, again, staff finds that three-story scale is not appropriate because it's larger than the historic house, which is just two and a half stories. Any rear structure, <coughs> excuse me, should have a height lower than the historic building and be a maximum of two and a half stories. Also, although zoned for five units, the historic context is primarily single family and two family houses. The scale of the real structure is not appropriate to this historic context. Um, and here are some renderings that were provided by the applicant. Just one note, um, the, the staff recommendation discusses the fact that there isn't a pathway to um, the rear structure. That The applicant told me that it wasn't included on the outbuilding, but you can, you can see here in the um, uh, rendering that they are including a pathway to those rear structures. Um, and this is an existing, that's not a driveway, that's an existing side alley that they will be accessing. Uh, this is the uh, left elevation. Um, there's some uncovered parking off of the side alley. And this is again that same elevation looking back towards the rear alley. So in conclusion, staff recommends disapproval of the project, finding the height, scale, and roof form of the addition and rear structure do not meet sections 2B1A, 2B1B, 2B1E, 2B1I, and 2B2 of the Belmont Hillsboro design guidelines. 
Thank you, Melissa. Is the applicant here? Yes, yes. Please come forward, say your name and address, and your case. My name is Brian Layton. I'm with Brit Development. We're the builder representing the owner. Uh, thank you, Commission, for your time. Um, Brit Development, our focus is on historic neighborhoods. Currently, in the past two years, we either have under construction or have finished about 20 projects in historic overlays. So we're very familiar with the guidelines, but most of those projects are single family or two family dwellings on those lots. Um, in this case, with it being multifamily, we feel like that the commission should look at the guidelines from a different perspective, more in line with what I believe Melissa showed some pictures of the development immediately to the left. That's a one acre lot with 15 units. And you know that's, that's more in keeping with the design that we're going for here. We worked very hard on the addition um, part of the design to try and follow the guidelines, um, with that being just an addition to a historic house. But as far as the detached building, I think Melissa pointed out, it's not an outbuilding, it's not a dadu, it is new construction on a multifamily lot. And so we're asking the commission to look at the design of that structure in the back from that perspective. Um, the architect is here. He's going to speak more to um, the actual design. So thank you. My name is Martin Wick. I'm at 912 Bailey Street. I'm the architect for this project. Um, 1707 Blair Boulevard was built as a single family house and still looks like one, uh, as do most of the houses on this block. Um, after this house was built, the zoning was changed to RM20 to allow multifamily development. This house is currently badly divided into six units and it is starting to fall apart. Some of the pictures um, that were up there earlier kind of showed that a little bit. Um, our goal is to restore the historic house and leave its street presence intact while designing the five units that the zoning allows us to build on this site. Uh, we intend to respect the historic character but would also like to build to the standards being set for multifamily development in this neighborhood. We understand the guidelines are designed to protect the character of single family neighborhoods but our new construction is not simply an addition or an outbuilding to a single family house. We are building three new units. We placed unit three adjacent to the existing house to allow for more space uh, between the, the new construction, but we could also detach it, which would create less space, uh, less open space on the lot. RM20 zoning allows for build, building footprint up to 60% lot coverage and three stories. Uh, we are currently at 48% lot coverage um, but are still being asked to reduce our footprint. At some point, the zoning should be taken into account on this project. Uh, the Jenkins townhomes two doors down have set a precedent for density and scale for or multifamily developments in this neighborhood. There are three stories with roof deck access along Belmont and Blair. This side of the street is bookended by multifamily developments and the demand continues to grow for this type of unit. We are trying to meet this demand with appropriately sized units and by including the amenities someone would expect to find in modern construction in this neighborhood, while at the same time restoring the historic house and maintaining its street presence. Staff's comments mentioned that we are respecting the historic character with our opening sizes, material choices, and the location of the, of the buildings. We are not trying to overwhelm the historic house. Unit three is only two feet, four inches taller, and units four and five are the same height. And a lot of that can be put down to modern building practice, practices. Our floor structure is much thicker than a, a historic houses would have been. Um, none of their footprints are larger than the existing house. We feel this design is an appropriate size and keeps with the growing density of the neighborhood. We feel that all of staff's comments address what is appropriate for the scale of an addition to a single family historic house. We're asking the commission to consider this as a multifamily development and to find a compromise between what zoning allows, the density we feel is necessary, and what the guidelines allow. Uh, we would like to have a discussion about how to move forward and appreciate your time. Thank you. Um, public comment? Anyone here to speak on this matter? All right, close public hearing. Discussions? Internal. Think about it. <laughs> I have yet to be present for one where it's a multifamily, other than like a duplex. Um, are there 
I don't know if you all have any experience with, you know, the difference, um, if, if there is one, you know, between how we view the single family, you know, versus this RM20, you know, the zoning. Um, you know, since I personally don't have any experience with that, y'all have any in, at your time. I mean, generally speaking, the RM20 zonings are relevant to our analysis. It, it, it matters a little bit, and I think in the way that people try to accommodate as much as they can given the underlying base zoning entitlements, but it doesn't mean you can triple the size of a 100-year-old single-family home. Um, if this was new construction, maybe it'd be different, but, you know, they said new construction, but it's an addition, and then it's an outbuilding. Um, I don't think there's any justification for the addition being taller than the uh, primary structure that's two and a half stories tall, um, other than just wanting it. Uh, the outbuilding isn't even close to the outbuilding guidelines in terms of massing. Um, there's already six units inside the little, uh, not little, the two and a half story existing home. They're entitled to five. So, I mean, they, they can put a substantial addition on this that's still subordinate to the uh, primary structure and enjoy the benefit of five units. They just can't put five single family homes on it, in my opinion, it's just overloading and completely swallowing the historic home. And I agree and feel that there are ways that this could be designed to accomplish, accomplish a lot of the goals, probably not with quite as much volume on the site and uh, working more with the staff to make it compatible with the existing structure. So uh, based on that, I move for disapproval based on staff recommendations. There's a motion. Second. There's a second. All in favor? Uh, I, I think we've already had discussion of that, so. We've, we've already made the motion. It's not, I guess, after your motion, I want to ask a question about what we can do on this side. So, um, all in favor of the motion? Aye. Any opposed? None? So the motion carries. So just really quickly, uh, the way that the zoning code is written, we are uh, only required to have 10 feet between buildings on a site. If we were to detach what's being called the addition right now and put 10 feet in between our back building, a new unit three, and the existing house, how then would the guidelines apply to this uh, project? Um, uh, I think the the motion of the board is that you do work with the staff so okay, that it so we will should just continue to talk to them if we're going to do yes. that. Yes. Okay. Thank, thank you. you so much. Twenty six oh nine. Oh no. One eleven Fourth Avenue. Oh, sorry. Is that the one? One eleven Fourth Avenue South. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> I'll let you off the hook. It's a long afternoon. Because you know. <laughs> I have a note from the applicant. The client wishes to, wishes to defer to the next meeting. That's 111 Fourth Avenue, yeah. so it will be deferred. So Thank you. I just wanted to flip ahead. Okay. 2609 Barton Avenue. Okay. 2609 Barton Avenue is a circa 1920 stone house that contributes to the historic character of the Hillsborough West End Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. The lot, as you can see in the photo, does slope steeply up from the front to the back. The application is to construct an addition that is six feet taller than the historic house. The addition is, set, is inset six feet from the right side of the house on the right side, and on the left side, the addition is inset two feet from the back corner for a depth of 10 feet. After that depth, the addition steps back out to match the line of the historic house. The addition has a, a total depth of 30 feet. Um, so as I mentioned just a minute ago, the addition is proposed to be six feet taller than the historic house. The design guidelines, as we talked about just a few minutes ago, um, stated that ap additions can be up to four feet taller than historic houses if the taller portion has a roof that is hipped, clipped, or side gabled. Um, and so no notice here that part of the addition that is taller, that part 
which is gabled is four feet taller, but typically we'd want to see it at least clipped, if not hipped or side gabled. So the steep slope of the lot complicates constructing a one-story addition to this one-story house. The site is approximately four feet higher at the back of the addition than it is at the back of the historic house. So you can see on the um, illustration that the architect submitted um, that they are planning to do some excavation work because of the, the site. Um, the applicant intends to dig out the site and construct a retaining wall at the rear, but would like to minimize the amount of the site that they have to dig out. The applicant would therefore prefer to have a two-story structure with a smaller footprint rather than a one-story structure with a larger footprint. Because of the steep slope of the site and the relative shortness of the historic house, which is just, six feet, feet, just 16 feet tall above the finished floor line, staff finds that there could be justica justification for an addition that is taller than the historic house and possibly taller than four feet, um, which is typically allowed under the design guidelines. In a couple of discrete instances where there have been severe site constraints like this one, the Historic Zoning Commission has approved additions that were more than four feet taller than the historic house. However, sa staff recommends that several changes be made to the design to bring it more in compliance with the design guidelines and more appropriate to the historic house. Um, so one, we ask that the front gable or slash dormer be clipped as is required in the design guidelines. Two, we ask that the addition be no taller than five feet taller than the historic house, lowering it by one foot. <coughs> Excuse me. This will allow for a seven foot interior floor to ceiling height, which um, it's our understanding is the minimum um, that you can have. And then um, the third recommendation would be that the taller portion of the addition be inset two feet from the sidewall of the historic house on the left side. This will help to minimize the visibility of the addition from the street and to keep its overall scale appropriate. Um, so just here's some additional information. Here's the rear addition and the left side addition. Uh, here is uh, a drawing that shows the visibility of the structure from the street. And here are additional photographs that were provided by the applicant of the site. I think the applicant's going to talk about this one, so I'll let her do that. Um, so in conclusion, staff recommends approval of the project with the following conditions. The front facing gable be clipped. The taller portion of the addition be inset two feet from the sidewall of the historic house on the left side. The addition be no taller than five feet taller than the historic house. The staff approve the roof color and the location of the HVAC. With these uh, changes, staff finds that the project meets the design guidelines. And before I pass it on to the applicant, I just wanted to note that we did receive some public comment on this, which should have been forwarded to you. I think two or three of them were in support and one of them had maybe some concerns. Thank you, Melissa. Applicant, please come forward. Hi, my name is Caitlin Smouse. I'm at 912 Bailey Street. I'm the architect for this project. Um, first, I just wanted to kind of describe the house a little bit more um, to give you a better understanding for it. Um, it's only about 1,500 square feet right now. It's two bedrooms, one bath, um, pretty much a one-story structure. It's at the very top of the hill on Barton. Um, it's hard to see in those pictures, but it's kind of at the peak. Um, and the lot slopes a total of 24 feet from the sidewalk to the top of the hill in the backyard. Um, currently, you know, the finished floor of the house is over 15 feet from the sidewalk. Um, this house is shorter than the neighbors with a very low slope roof. The existing attic space is only five foot six. Um, so with this project, we cannot even consider a ridge raise because if we go up another two feet, that doesn't even allow us enough space for a second story addition. Um, basically, we're on the wrong side of the hill. Uh, across the street at 2606 Barton, which is the next page, um, <laughs> they, you know, they're on the right side of the hill. They were um, allowed to go down a full story and allowed, you know, a ridge raise and go up. They essentially have three stories of space with over 7,000 square feet. Um, with this addition, 2609 will be just over 3,000 square feet. Um, the owners love the historic house, love the neighborhood, are planning to keep the front of the house and the historic character intact. Our goal is to maintain the historic character from the street while adding necessary square footage for their family at the rear of the house. And also, I would just like to point out that um, in that drawing, the front part is cut off and that dotted line is actually the view line from a person standing on the sidewalk. Um, just a little note. Um, 
The limitations of the lot in the existing house caused us to design an addition that holds fairly tight to the back of the house and to go taller in a way that is not visible from the street, but still provides usable space on the second floor. We will still need to excavate the hill and build a five foot to six foot retaining wall um, that's moving a lot of rock and it's a lot of expense. Um, to address the, the three conditions specifically. So the first condition requires that the front gable be clipped. When we designed the addition, we broke it up into two portions. A lower portion that con connects, excuse me, the existing with the new, and a taller portion for the bedrooms at the rear. The lower gable only allows for a seven foot ceiling and a stair landing in the bathroom on the second floor. Clipping that roof would make that space almost unusable. Um, due to the grade, it cannot be seen from the street. So whether we clip it or not, you, you can't see it at all from the street. Um, second condition asks that the left side be inset two feet from the historic wall of the house. We are currently aligned with the existing house after stepping in two feet for a distance of 10 feet. Also, the lot is 60 feet wide, which technically means we are allowed to have a side addition per the guidelines. Um, we're not asking to go any wider, but if we inset it, we will need to go back further into the hill to get the required square footage, um, which again adds cost to the project. Um, the neighboring house on the left is only um, 11 foot, eight inches away, and there's only a very small sliver of space from the seat from the street where you actually see the addition, and that's shown in that view diagram. Um, and you can see that in that picture. You can also see that there's a current outbuilding there that you can see pretty much all of, um, and we feel like the addition is gonna look a little bit better than that current outbuilding. Um, <clears throat> Also wanted to refer to 2615 Barton, which is a couple houses down. Um, it had an addition that was approved in 2014, which is wider on both sides. Um, they built an addition to the left with a port cochere on the right. Um, it has, I think, a 70 foot lot, but again, wider than 60 feet, so they were allowed a side addition. Um, the third condition asks that the addition be five feet taller than the house. While we understand that the guidelines specify that an addition only be four feet taller, we do have a very unusual situation. Um, the house is much shorter than the typical Tudors and bungalows on the neighborhood, and adding onto the back means excavating rock, which is extremely expensive. Um, the second story only has an eight foot ceiling. We're not asking for anything very tall here. Um, our roof slope is matching the slope of the existing house, which is low, which does not really, you know, that image of cutting it down a foot means that the roof slope would change from a 512 to maybe a 312 pitch, which is almost essentially a flat roof. Um, we really want to emulate the massing of the house and the roof form of the house with a 512 roof pitch back there. Um, you know, lowering it from an eight foot ceiling definitely decreases resale value and just creates not very usable space. We understand that we're asking for more height than is typically allowed, but we believe this is an unusual situation. We have designed an addition that is efficient and very reasonable size given the context of the neighborhood. Um, we're keeping the historic house intact. Um, please let me know if you have any questions. Thanks. And the Thank owner, you. I'm sorry, the owner is here too. And she's I'm sorry? The owner is here and she's okay. going to say something. Sure. Hi, I'm Tori Morgan. Thank you for your time. Um, so I think Caitlin did a good job of addressing all of the concerns, but I just wanted to give the personal side. So um, my husband and I lived in the house for eight years. We love the house. We love the neighborhood. We love the historic um, character of our house. But we're now a family of four and growing out of the, the two-bedroom, one-bath house. We need more space for our two growing boys as well as a guest room for the visiting grandparents. <laughs> um, so we're planning to stay. We, we are building this um, addition to, to grow old in this house. And we love, like I said, we love our neighborhood. We're invested in, in our neighborhood and um, going to send our kids to, pre to the public school down the street and, um, again, plan to stay. So we, and we embrace the historic nature of the neighborhood and we respect the historic overlay guidelines and what they're set to do, which is why our plan preserves the historic look from the street. You will not be able to see either of the, the roof lines from the street, as Caitlin pointed out, with the, the sight line. Um, and we also want to preserve, preserve the historic character on the inside of the house, which is an important reason to have um, higher ceilings in the addition. So it's an old house with nine foot ceilings, um, and we want to emulate the old historic feel throughout the house as much as possible um, and have eight foot ceilings in our addition. Um, but of course, there are also practical reasons to have eight foot ceilings, um, like having usable space for two teenage boys. Um, and in terms of the clipped gable request, that would make the shower probably unusable for two teenage boys. So I just, there are a lot of practical reasons, but also just preserving that historic character. Um, 
So I, I really believe that what we're asking for is reasonable and preserves the historic character of the home. Um, the lower gable will not be seen from the street, and the one extra foot of height that we're um, asking for in the taller portion will also not be seen from the street. And our house really is an anomaly being shorter and one story um, and at the top of the hill. So we respectfully ask for an exception and think it's an appropriate time for one. Um, the, as Melissa said, there, our neighbors sent in emails about the, um, our addition. We showed the plans to both of our next door neighbors um, and they both told us they're in support of our project as well as the, um, some neighbors down the street. So and they're really the ones that are gonna be affected since um, you won't be able to see this from the street. So um, thank you for your time. When you're uh, making your decision, please just consider our physical limitations that we're facing, um, as well as our efforts to preserve the historic character. Thank you. A question, yeah. uh, since you're already there. So yeah. the only thing that, the, under the recommendation summary, which is the one that you're asking us to reconsider? Well, all of them, but the one that we feel most, or that I feel most strongly about are both of the, um, the, well, the, the height, um, the, we'd like to keep it at six feet so that it's um, usable space and c maintains the historic character of the home. But then also the um, clipped gable thing, if, we, if okay. we clip that on the lower gable, it's not a usable shower. Okay. So those are the two main things. The coming in on the left, I'm, I'm less concerned about, but it seems just that one doesn't even um, make sense with the guidelines. Okay. So I guess all three we want on there. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone in public comment? Okay, close public hearing, a discussion by the board. I think they are really handicapped at this site, and I don't wish excavation on anyone <laughs> as working for a contractor, um, especially a homeowner. I just think that's, I mean, that's a real burden. They're already doing it, you know, I mean, they have to do it no matter what the plan is. Um, so that, the site is just very interesting. Um, and then the current house that sits on it being already just so small, um, you know, that, that's just something to consider. I, I agree with that. When you look at the vicinity map on the second page of the staff recommendation, top of the second page, the topo on that is, it's crazy. I mean, it literally is at the top of a gigantic hill which makes me think, I, normally I think all of staff's conditions are spot on and exactly what you would do if it was anywhere relatively flat. Uh, I feel like here it's so unusual to be at the top of this hill. Um, it's pushed pretty far back. The, they're already doing a ton of excavation and because it's Nashville, it'll probably hit rock and it will be expensive. Uh, sorry. Uh, it seems to me like it's really, it'll look just fine the way that it's all things considered. And uh, I think it works with the guidelines as far as we can uh, push them, especially in a unique situation like this. Sarah, will you have anything? Okay. Is there a motion? <laughs> I can't make the motion. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, I'll move for approval based on staff recommendation, including uh, conditions four and five, but not one, two, three. There's a motion. Is there a second? A second. All in favor of the motion? Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Is that enough for instruction, Robin? Thank you very much. We are at, okay, 920 Wald Kirch was Consent. Consent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we now have 1825 4th Avenue North. 1825 4th Avenue North is an application for a duplex infill and outbuilding. In March 2017, the Historic Zoning Commission voted to allow the demolition of this contributing house at 1825 4th Avenue North based on economic hardship. So we are here today to uh, look at the design of the infill to replace it. 
Here is site plan, the site plan. The infill will meet all base zoning setbacks. The outbuilding uh, does require a rear setback determination from 20 feet to five foot six inches. Uh, and staff does found, find that this rear setback is appropriate. Here is the front facade. Staff finds that the overall height of three, 34 feet nine inches meets the design guidelines and the historic context. However, the front dormers give the infill the appearance of a two and a half story house, whereas the historic context is a maximum of two stories. There are no two and a half story historic homes in the Salem Town Conservation Zoning Overlay. And in fact, there's only one true two story historic house. All the infill development that has been approved by MHCC since the overlay has been two stories or lower. Because the front dormers give the infill a two and a half story form, staff recommends that these dormers be removed. Staff recommends that the French porch columns have a cap and a base, and we further recommend that four inch nominal wood corner boards be installed at the corners of all um, areas of siding. Here are the side facades. The upper portion of the roof is removed at the back in order to create a rooftop terrace above the second story. Since the rooftop terrace is at the back of the house and will not be highly visible from the street, staff does find it to be appropriate. The front porch is drawn as five feet, eight inches, and staff recommends that the porch be a minimum of six feet. Um, the design guidelines state that porches should be no shallower than six feet, so we ask that it be made four inches deeper. Here's the rear facade. Here are the drawings for the one-story outbuilding. Here are some perspective drawings. So in conclusion, staff recommends approval with the following conditions. The finished floor height be consistent with the adjacent finished floor heights. The front dormers be removed. Front porch be a minimum of six feet deep. All exposed corners have nominal four inch corner boards and that's on the um, siding areas, not on um, the brick areas. The French porch columns have a cap and a base. Staff approve the brick samples, um, the roof shingle and, and metal colors, um, the windows and doors and the location of the HVAC units. With these conditions, staff finds that the project meets the design guidelines. The applicant is here. Any questions for Melissa? Okay, no, for right now. Applicant, please. My name is uh, Dawn White. I am um, here on, um, on behalf of the contractor representing the applicant. And we are in compliance with all of the recommendations um, by the staff, but we would um, ask to reconsider the dormers. Um, we feel like they add um, quite a bit of um, uh, just character to the front of the home. It is not a two and a half story home. It is just a two story home. It is just um, just a little bit more head height and it allows, um, it, I still think that, it, I feel like it looks much more aesthetically pleasing than just, um, just expansive roof. Um, the particular picture that's drawn here is, is a little bit larger than they would actually appear. We're just talking about a little tiny pop-up. Not, this is very long, it doesn't, it wouldn't look quite like this. It, we're working with the architect to have that changed. The other question that we did want to address, if possible, is we wanted to discuss the, the outbuildings. Is, is there any way that they can be a little bit larger to allow for two full cars in each unit? Maybe a few hundred square feet each, so maybe 150, something like that. It's, it's, they're right at, it's right at 750 currently. Yep, I can just clarify. So they're drawn at 750 square feet and the design guidelines and our outbuilding guidelines state that for lots less than 10,000 square feet, which this one is, we've limited outbuildings to 750 square feet in footprint. Okay, thank you. Um, public comment. All right, close public comment. Discussions, please. So just, Melissa, to be clear, you stated we've only, or the, the, this commission has only approved in this um, overlay two stories or lower, and I mean, this appears to be a three-story house. Yeah, so all of the infills that we've approved um, have been two stories. Most of them have a hip roof form, um, maybe a cross gable form. I don't know if we've approved any side gable forms, but it was staff's opinion that with those dormers, particularly at the front, it really does have a three, a, you know, two and a half story form. We're a little bit less concerned about what happens further back because that's less visible from the street. Mm -hmm. 
in a lot of the ones we've discussed, you know, there's like a height, you know, can't be this too tall, you know, so I'm just, it, it does seems so tall to me. <laughs> the design guidelines limit the height to, is it 35 or 36 feet? Do you remember? 35 feet. This is 34 feet, nine inches. Salem Town is a little bit different than some of the other neighborhoods because there was so much infill development done pr shortly before the overlay. So we've pretty much allowed a maximum height of 35 feet, no matter where it is in the district. I think the staff's done a good job at working with the applicant to uh, come up with appropriate uh, forms and shapes. And I think the recommendations are reasonable. I, I think with you know, in essence, two four-bedroom units. I don't think that the, you know, that that changing the precedent on the garages would make a, uh, a precedent that we'd want to live with, and would make a significant difference when you have, in essence, eight bedrooms on this site. So, uh, so I would I would recommend that we approve uh, with staff recommendations. There's a motion. Yep. Second. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? None. Motion carries. So that means this is approved what's recommended by the staff? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. What do we do with This is an application for illumination of 300 Broadway. It includes adding exterior lighting to the mechanical screen at the top of the building, on and above the cornice at the second level, on each pilaster between the first and second levels, and above the cornice, above the first level on the rear side. Staff has two main concerns with the proposal, which is the lighting on the rooftop addition and the requested color illumination, otherwise it all meets the design guidelines. The lighting on the addition is inappropriate as the addition should be as minimally visible as possible. Lighting of the mechanical screen will only draw attention to the new construction, which is not the intent of the design guidelines for rooftop additions, which states that additions should not be visually jarring or contrasting to the historic building. This rendering does not fully reflect, reflect your previous approval for the rooftop addition, but it is being used to show the rooftop lighting request only. Illumination should be white or a daylight color as colored illumination changes the color of the building and would detract from the historic character of the building. No other buildings within the district have been approved with color illumination. Staff is continuing to research this issue but recommends that at this time it be disapproved and then if the policy or the design guidelines change, the applicant always can, re can always return uh, with a request for the colored lighting. Staff recommends approval with the conditions that the KX5 lighting be removed, that's the one at the very top, and it is not direct, as it is not directed towards the building, it's in an inappropriate location, and it does not meet the design guidelines for rooftop additions. And that the color of the, X, the KX2 fixture, and that's the one on the pilasters, is a dark metal color or a color to match the building, and that the color of the illumination is a white daylight color. With these conditions, staff finds the proposal to meet the design guidelines for lighting and rooftop additions in the Broadway overlay. Did you have any questions for me? Thanks. Thanks, Robin. Applicant? Thank you, Steve Tuck with Tuck Hinton Architects. Um, <clears throat> we have a couple other slides we'd like to. We've got two issues that we would like to discuss. One is the, the backlighting of the mechanical screen, and the second one is the ability to use colored lighting. Uh, some of you are new and don't remember the discussion back in October, but we had asked our building, uh, we could actually ex ask to exceed the height of 15 feet required by a couple feet in order to add the mechanical screen. Uh, that was rejected and not approved, and so we actually lowered the building, the ceiling height of this addition, two feet, in order to get the total mechanical screen of four feet within the 15-foot height. So if you go to the next slide, please. This is a diagram showing sort of our feeling about this. Both of them include, so where we are is we're 15 feet above the parapet for the mechanical screen. We could have very easily done the diagram on the left, which shows that the, the ability of the building to be lit for 15 feet above the parapet is well within the, within the guidelines. But if, it's, if it lit, lives lit by interior light, that's acceptable. 
all we're doing is saying we wanted to do the mechanical screen. We had a lot of discussion about whether to even do it or not because obviously it's expensive. In fact, when we presented to this body in October, we talked about it being acrylic. It was going to be backlit, and there, of course, we weren't asking for lighting, but there was no discussion as to whether that was a problem or not a problem. So our position is simply all we're trying to do is show that this lighted space is 15 feet tall, which is required. The fact that it's not interior light coming through backlighted glass, we're just light, the light happens to be on the outside of the building, if you will, indirectly lighting that, uh, that acrylic panel on the roof that's hiding the mechanical unit. And I think that's important to, to, to really, because again, y'all didn't want to, well, staff wasn't really concerned about the mechanical screen. We felt, the owner and ourselves, it was important to have the mechanical screen there. It was also important that it be lit to show the activity that's up there when the people are on the terrace looking up the mechanical unit, and it's not just a piece of metal that's wrapping the mechanical unit. And so that was something that's very important to us. And I think that the intent of these two diagrams show that the building's going to look exactly the same. One or the other, the one on the left is totally accept, accept, acceptable. The one on the right would not be, as staff has, has uh, discussed it with us. The uh, second issue, uh, if you go to the next slide, I mean, this is a shot that we took of Broadway a couple weeks ago. All the buildings are in color, like it or not. They are. It's all colored. Most of that's reflected from the sign and other things. I think staff would say, well, a lot of those are non-conforming or whatever. People add lights and do this and do that. Uh, again, we, had, we mentioned this to the staff many, many months ago, and the response to us was, as long as it doesn't blink and whatever, it's probably going to be okay. We now understand that it is, um, that we're the first ones that have asked for that. I think there's something, if you go to the next slide, that's really important. Our building's the only building that's cream colored in limestone. Every other building on there is dark red brick. You can't put colored light on dark red brick. Uh, it just doesn't work. So we have an opportunity here that other buildings on Second Avenue don't have. Uh, our sales with the owner have hired CM Clean, David Gatton, who was the lighting designer we worked with on the convention center. We've got a professional lighting consultant. It's going to be lit well. It's going to be lit professionally. And the whole issue of color is not that this thing is going to flash color. That's not the intent. The intent is to make the building celebratory, not unlike the bridges or the pyramid at the Science Center, where on occasion, if, if, uh, if Blake Shelton shows up, who's, you know, Old Red's the name of this, 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 uh, this, uh, this uh, restaurant and bar, you know, if he shows up, they might light it in red at night. If the Titans win, maybe it's blue. I don't know what their intent is, but that's the intent. It's a celebratory kind of thing for holidays or events that may happen, and it's not going to be like at night. During the day, the building's going to look like this, obviously. So we're talking about five or six hours at night. It's going to be done well. It's going to be done professionally. I think that if you look at the, the guidelines, which there are four of them for, for exterior lighting, We've met all those guidelines. There's nothing in there that says anything about the not being able to use color. I mean, like I said, as you can see on the existing buildings, there's color, color everywhere. Uh, the staff has recommended that there be a work session and you all discuss this in the future. But I think that's difficult as seen on other uh, previous uh, today, other previous. We're going by the guidelines now. If you all elect in two months or three months to say that doesn't make sense, that's fine, but I think it's very difficult for us when we've been sort of led for six months thinking we're in a direction that's okay to then say, well, well we've never been asked this before. We need to re reconsider this whole thing and we need to have a staff meeting on it. So we think we're being very reasonable. It's going to be done very well. And uh, I think the fact that our building is a unique building in color as well as height uh, makes that appropriate uh, for, for asking that we al be allowed to do color in the way that we're doing it. Thank you. Uh, many questions before, okay. Um, public comment, anyone else to speak for or, okay. Close public hearing, um, discussion. Uh, I'd like to make a comment here. Steve, I appreciate the work you did to lower that roof top addition. I think that the siding around the mechanicals is a better look than just having the mechanicals out there. And so I just wanted to tell you that I appreciate your work on that. I am um, 
you know, I, I'm a, I'm a, I consider myself a preservationist, and I, I, I love the architecture of buildings, and that's why the work on just the buildings themselves is, is, is so important to me personally as the look. Um, as far as the illumination, I don't have a lot of experience with this in the Historic Zoning Commission and how, and I'm sorry I'm going to miss that that session, but um, I like color. I like, um, I like uh, pizzazz. I, I love this project. It's going to be a great addition to Broadway. Uh, I like the fact that the colors can change on the buildings, you know, the celebratory uh, feature of it. I'm not as confident of why the, the mechanical screen needs to be lit up, but uh, I just wanted to make those points. So, Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Robin, just to clarify some things about the applicable design guidelines uh, that's listed in our packet, uh, general principle lighting, these are, these, these are directly from the, over, the design overlay for Broadway. The design guidelines we were following? Yes. Yes. That, that's in our packet. It says general principle lighting. Yes. Just want to make sure. Yes. Okay, guidelines for lighting, et cetera. Yes. It's, it's not italicized. It is, it is the guideline. Right. Okay, thank you. No, but it says simple and unobtrusive in design. This is the discussion. That's my question. I mean, yes, obviously it's going to be done well. This, this is a great company is behind this project. Um, but just if we allow this red building, I understand it's a cream building. I mean, this is my f favorite building on Broadway. Um, it, it. Yeah, for, <laughs> worked in it. Um, it just makes me, I don't know, just people like to, even if this one's going to be done so well, everybody takes it, oh, let's let's add something to my building. You know, there's there's less reputable um, ownership of these buildings that changes hands so much and these bars come in and out. Uh, so, you know, I just, so that makes me worried, although I know it, I mean, it, it, it is nice um, and I know it's going to be done really well. Um, that's just one thing, just as a precedent of the colored lighting, if, if it is something, then if somebody else comes in, you know, even if you can't see it that well, it's lit up blue, even if it's a dark building. Um, that's just what kind of makes me worried about that. Um, that's my comment. Yeah, I, I share some of the same concerns about precedent, and um, we've got half our commission gone. There's a already a meeting scheduled to try to discuss the issues and provide more clarity to help applicants. That's already scheduled. Um, because of those two reasons, I mean, I immediately start with, well, that's that's a pretty big hurdle at this point. Um, it sounds like there was a misunderstanding some time ago about whether this would be okay or not, but it's coming to us just today for the first time. So I don't, not disrespecting that situation that apparently is there, I don't feel a ton of urgency to, to be put on the spot to make that decision now without some information because I think lighting up the buildings um, we already have a situation on Broadway where everybody wants more signage. They, they aren't getting enough, they want more, and it's, we're already close to a tipping point where you can hardly even see the buildings anymore, and we're supposed to be preserving the architecture. Um, and I, I, what, he, what he showed didn't offend me necessarily. I just would like to have a full commission and some more discussion and more information before we because I think that's a really big new thing that we haven't allowed before. Just to caution ourselves is that, you know, again, we're always reminded that we, we um, look at a project today and this is what we look at and, and it is, a, you know, again, another conversation. But, um, you know, we don't know if these guidelines would ever change, you know, and maybe the timeline for the applicant is, they have a timeline and they want to keep moving. And I think, I, you know, I don't know if that's pushing a decision or not, but um, again, just um, the question would be, will it change even if you have discussion in the future? Yeah, it may or may not, which is why I'm, I mean, that the worst thing we can do is a, approve it and then have all this discussion and decide it was a bad idea. 
and then we've just let one person do it, and we're going to tell everybody else no again. I think that that. So are you suggesting that they would defer this? Uh, Is that what you're suggesting? Uh, that would be my suggestion, just so we could have a more meaningful discussion about it. And I'm sorry it's just coming up now, um, and it apparently has been under other discussions for some period of time, if that's the case. But you know, from our perspective, we're just seeing it for the first time here, and we've got five of our nine, and there's already a meeting to discuss issues just like this schedule. Applicant, what do you think about that? I think that um, there's a lot of, um, my opinion is there is a lot of connectivity between lighting the buildings and signage. We could easily, which is what the other people have done, their signs put a color on the building, right? We could easily design a sign that did the same thing. You just allowed blinking signs you allowed signs to change colors. They're fairly large signs. We could do the exact same thing and have our sign change red and have our sign change blue and have it blink every second, right? You just already proved that. And what we're saying is there needs to be, I think there needs to be a distinction between the signs and what they're doing and what the building's doing. Our building's not gonna be blinking all the time in that. But to sit here and say that you can't put color on the building, but I'm gonna let signs have all the color they want and we aren't even approving color on signs, that's not the issue. And the signs are what are putting the color on the buildings. You've got color on the buildings whether you like them or not. And we're saying let us do it the right way and set an example for the rest of Broadway how it should be done. Not, not allow the signage to be the color on the buildings because you've got that whether you like it or not. I agree with everything you said. I'm just asking for, I think it would be a good idea for us to have some time to talk about that. Um, you saw the, the Dadu discussion today with our buildings. That's a simple issue compared to lighting. And what happened there with crafting it as we go, we get ourselves boxed in and we, we end up uh, with at least some perceived inconsistency and unfairness. Uh, here, I think there's a lot more at stake monetarily and visibility to the public and it's something that uh, taking a couple more weeks to have a more meaningful discussion with more of the commission and uh, more information would would be prudent. Um, for what it's worth, I, I like what you're showing. I just want to hear what other people think and we only have half our commission here today. I mean, you might consider whether in two weeks or, or now, you might consider allowing us to do that and again, setting the right example. And if it doesn't work, then fine, nobody else gets to do it. We I, I think that's something that- And, and you can base your use. guidelines on what works and what doesn't work and what's appropriate or not. Otherwise, it's just talk, right. right? You have nothing to point to other than what's bad on Broadway. You don't have the good example, really. And um, anyway- That's right. The, the discussion that, that I wanna have that we haven't had and I want um, more information, other people's perspective and ideas on it about whether it makes sense to trade building signage for more illumination of the building. Similar to what you're proposing here, you're not putting a big sign on it, yes. but in, it, you wouldn't want a big sign and the building illumination, that'd be overkill. You're making a trade. And that, to me, seems sensible, but I want to have some time to craft a policy that is written that we can look at and think about and talk about and make sure we get it right, because it's... Uh, It'll be hard to get right on the fly. So, see, these fixtures are capable of, of being white as well as other oh, colors. Yes. Is that right? Yes. So, in reality, as far as staff conditions, if you were proposing to make them white, the fixture would be the same. The color of the fixture is a comment that would have to be dealt with. 
I mean, so, these are LED, they're all LED, LED right. fixtures. Now, if we went to all white fixtures, for example, there would be a savings. You don't have the controllers sure. for the, the, the thing that I think is important, and we've had conversations with our lighting designer about this, the thing that's really important for us is we want to have the ability to adjust the color. With white, you don't have that ability. It's sort of whiter. You get what you buy, right? With the ability to adjust the LED color spectrum, we have the ability to get the colors that we feel are the most appropriate soft colors that are working with a cream colored brick, right? Because if you put a, you know, a different color on a cream colored brick, it might look different than you really want. So you want to be able to adjust that and fine tune it. And that's, that's the ability. But you know, you're paying tens of thousands of dollars more to have that ability but it's important for the client to, to, to do that. I mean, it's an important thing for them, and they think like, because right, we, we're on a corner lot. We could have a huge sign. We have sign runs all, probably always side, upside of the corner of the building and let that sign do the color changing for us. But I just don't think that's the right thing to do. And I think our client, Ryman Properties, you know, they do, they do things right, and we try to do things right, and uh, that's what we're trying to do, and, and uh, we just appreciate your consideration. While I'm up here, excuse me. So, no, no. Um, so, do you want us to make, we're, we're, at, we're asking you if you want to defer it. If not, we will make a decision, and that which might be, you know, lean toward a negative. I, I don't know, but yeah. but what what would you like to do? You would like us to I mean, I think if we're talking about, you know, a couple weeks, and, and uh, I had spoken with Tim Walker about this, and he told me it'd be in the next, you know, four to six weeks. He thought he'd try to set this meeting up. When was that, Robin? I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think it's already scheduled. March it's scheduled 12th. May 12th. May 12th. May 12th. Um, and it's already for. Um, it's it's. Um, and I assume that part of that agenda. will be public discussion and input and so forth. It, it's not a public hearing, but anyone's welcome to listen and attend. Okay. But of course, you won't be able to make a decision at that meeting for this project. Right. That would need to Have wait to come until back. May. Oh, the the, next say, meeting. when is the project set to be completed? Next April. Our okay. time schedule. So you've got some time. Our time right? schedule's okay. I think okay. it affects you know marketing and thinking through you know what they're doing and all that. Yeah. So I mean, the sooner the better. But I, I would, I would think that. And we would rather defer. Yeah, we've got good. owners represented yeah. here also. Beca with Ryman. Because we, yeah, I think so we'd good. rather defer if, in fact, it's set for May 12th, and then soon thereafter we could come back to this body and talk specifically about that issue. Okay. Well, it'll be a month from today. Yeah, so while when I'm we make the decision, question about the, the illumination issue. meeting will be in advance of the next scheduled right commission meeting. So it it would only be a deferral for one month. Well, I'm up here in questions about the uh, the backlit mechanical screen wall. Yeah. Can, can you explain the material of the screen wall? And, and it sounds like you've got it's a, a frosted material. acrylic. Okay. And so then. it's a it's a backlit frosted acrylic, and you know, again, our feeling is is that roof to rooftop addition could have four foot transom all the way around it with frosted glass, and it's perfectly fine. Right, internally lit, sure. and uh, and it's it's almost exact. The modules are the same. Everything's the same. The difference is that the light happens to be outside, shining through the frosted glass, then coming from within the building. That with the, so the drag diagram that we were showing just sort of shows that the the image is really the same. One's appropriate and considerably more expensive, and the other one, because it happens to be a mechanical screen, the light's outside, not inside. It's considered exterior lighting. All that, so it's. To me, it's semantics, because the ultimate end result will be, would be the same as if we'd built the building four feet taller and didn't use a mechanical screen at all. And, and you know, my personal fear, and not knowing what the owner says, is that if it's not backlit, which gives it, you know, I think make, it, it heightens the level of just a mechanical screen that's a painted metal screen, we could do it a whole lot cheaper than obviously with, with acrylic and LEDs running around the back of it to, to light the strip LEDs behind that. And then the next question is from the owner is, well, let's just get rid of the mechanical screen. It's not doing anything, with, with, you know, because there's nothing that says, I mean, and, and I want to make it clear, the mechanical screen is is so low as how it can make it. It's really hiding um, three and four foot units and a lot of duct work and everything else, but it's not hiding three huge monster mechanical units up there. We just, there's no way to do that. So we felt that was a good compromise and we lowered the height of the ceiling in there to at least get a mechanical screen, but it was not backlit. The next step is, well, if it's painted metal, what does it do? Well, what does that do for us? 
And so then does the whole thing go away because that's not even, that's not even in y'all's purview to decide whether we can put a screen there or not. We could just take it off. I don't want to do it because all the junk is even worse. And, and the thing that we, we, we need to realize on this particular building, because of its height, height, it's relatively prominent coming down Broadway. And so dealing with that mechanical was really, really important to us. It was important to the client, at least as best as we could under the guidelines. And, and, and Robin, if we could have the images that were shown here for our discussion too, that would be helpful for that meeting. So. Oh, sure. And I also in, encourage the applicant to, if they would like to submit written comments about the best way to do this, that might help us craft a policy about illumination. Um, I think that would be helpful too, because at least my opinion is what we saw there looked really nice, but I could also imagine how someone could do it very poorly. Yeah. And uh, even your, your ideas about what not to do would be appreciated. Okay, thank you for the discussion. I very appreciate that. All right, our um, final one is 1616 Douglas Avenue. This is the last item, uh, at least design review item on the agenda today, 1616 Douglas Avenue. And as you can see there, it is currently a vacant lot where there previously stood a non-contributing house. Um, and the address may be familiar uh, because in February, uh, the commission approved designs for a single family home uh, after a first proposal was uh, deferred at the December 2016 meeting. Uh, and a design today is now for a, uh, a duplex. Uh, there's the front elevation of the duplex there. Uh, it reads as one and a half stories from the front uh, with a side gabled roof and gabled front dormers and a pair of fr gabled front porches. And to the rear, it takes on uh, more of a two-story form. There's the side elevation. Both sides are uh, mirror images of each other. Uh, I've, I've gone into the details in the staff recommendation, and I'll just say, uh, in summary, staff finds the design to be compatible with the historic context. Uh, in fact, uh, well, there's the rear elevation. A very similar design was approved uh, recently, uh, within the last two years. Uh, this is also on Douglas Avenue. This is 1538 Douglas, just a few uh, few doors, maybe 10, 10 lots uh, east of the current proposal. It is really essentially the same design, but with different porches and a, a different front dormer. Um, you can see the, the side gabled roof, uh, the hyphen between and the gate section at the rear. Um, and as I said, that was approved. Seeing it now in context, staff finds the new proposal uh, will be very similar in appearance. Staff recommends approval of the project with the following conditions, that the floor height be consistent with the finished floor heights of adjacent houses, uh, that staff shall approve the door, uh, uh, doors and windows, roof color, and masonry prior to their selection and purchase, and that HVAC units are located behind the house or on the sides beyond the midpoint. Okay, thank you, Sean. Very patient applicant is yep. still here. Yeah. If you have any questions <laughs> thank for, you, for applicant. me or for them. I'm good. Okay. <laughs> so the applicant is in agreement with all the recommendations. Very good. Thank you so much. Um, anyone else in public comment? No. Closed public hearing, discussion, or motion? Uh, Madam, just, Madam Chairman, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, Madam Chairman, I recommend approval with staff recommendations. Thank you for that. And that second, recommend? and then just one quick okay. point for discussion. I think this is the one that we're looking at, the example that's similar to this one. Um, I think they both do a great job of, of getting a ton of square footage inside a neighborhood with one and a half story homes mm -hmm. without overwhelming everybody mm -hmm. next door. And this, this one's 20, 25 and a half feet tall 
we hear often that that just is impossible. It is. It's right. We, this is another good example that it can be done. I just think that's important to remember that when people tell us they can't go below 29, they can't go below 33, this is pretty good right here. And there, these, this is a big house, but it doesn't overwhelm the street. Good job, Commissioner. <laughs> all right, uh, there's a first and a second, and it's all in favor? Of I'm sorry, oh. I'm so sorry. Van put a uh, detached garage on the back. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, sorry. oh, do you need to talk I, about I didn't include it in the presentation, but there is a uh, detached outbuilding, not a dadu, uh, <laughs> uh, part of the application uh, with a setback reduction that is, um, uh, also, also recommended for approval. Sorry, I neglect, neglected to include that in my oral presentation. Okay, so that would have been approved administratively, so we wouldn't, that wouldn't have any effect on us? No, you're including that We're, in. Okay. If you agree, you're including that in your motion. Okay, do we need to read, amend the motion? Yes. Yes, we, Macy, do we need to amend the motion? If that wasn't the intent, then yeah. Okay. Right. So, so, uh, yes. so, Sean, can you tell us what the setback variance request is, so that we can include? Not it? in the staff recommendation. It was reducing the rear setback from 20 feet to 10 feet. Oh. Oh. Uh, it doesn't have. Yeah, I, I, that's correct. There were no conditions that we were recommending as part of the staff recommendation for the outbuilding. Oh, okay. That's what I meant. But, but it is analyzed in the report. Yeah. And it is oh, part okay. of the recommended approval. So then the motion clear. is sufficient. Okay. 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 <laughs> Thank you for clarification. All in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed? The patch, it passes. Thank you so much. All right, Robin, is there anything else we need to discuss? Clear if you would like for me to bring the Dadu outbuilding or, uh, policy to you next month for a vote, or if you wanted um, more discussion. And if you do want more discussion, are, do you want public meetings, more neighborhood? I, what do you think? I mean, it seems like people aren't happy, and. Yeah. Um, and they remain confused. I, I, we, yeah. I don't know if we have to do something, but we have to improve it some way. It's I agree. causing problems. And we would, as we talked about at the other meeting, I, I'm not sure that little changes here and there to policy or even little changes to the ordinance is going to get us to where we need to be. Yeah. Um, I think the best solution would be a plan book, but that's a much longer term solution. We need to find funding for it first. It'll take time to create. Um, we've been talking about this issue since at least 20, since we created the data in 2012, and since ordin and since outbuildings and data use have increased, uh, almost doubled every year since then. And what I'm hearing is that people are unhappy that you're that you don't allow some leeway, and they're unhappy that you do allow some leeway. So I'm I'm just not sure that there's a, a perfect answer with what we have right now. Um, again, the, the better solution is probably some, another tool altogether, which would be that plan book. Uh, and, and I agree. I think, think we all agree that having the plan book would be there, but since it's not in current funding mm -hmm. and, and not really in the pipeline, I think we continue to press for that. But until that, yes, uh, you have fairly specific comments that we made at the last meeting. I think if those were communicated to the same people, the, the neighborhood leaders and the councilmen for the districts that have conservation uh, zoning, and ask for their comments um, prior to the next meeting, you know, maybe a week prior or whatever, then if we need to, we can reevaluate. But okay. I, th I think going ahead and, and pressing to get comments from trying to make that as widely distributed as possible uh, so that the public can be informed and we get those comments. And for anyone who's listening, it is on the website now, so anyone can see it. 
And again, I did forward it to council members and neighborhood leaders, so it is available for anyone who'd like to comment. So on a timeline, is 30 days enough? Are we giving ourselves 30 days till the next meeting? I mean, uh, it seems still a little vague for us as well. It may depend on what we hear back. Yeah. I, I think okay. the discussion was the 30 days for public comment, and depending on what we hear back, I'm not sure we'd get a lot more comment from the public in 60 or 90 days mm -hmm. than we would in yeah. 30. So right. I think we see what comments we get back. That. If we need more time, if the comments indicate we need to study it a little bit more, then we can always do that. Okay. Yeah, and if, if you probably already have, but if, if it's posted on our website, if you send it to every council person and encourage them to share it with their constituents, mm -hmm. I think we have satisfied our obligation to try to tell as many people as possible. They, it's a reoccurring theme that people say they don't know about stuff, but it's also, you know, how hard did you try to find out? But yeah. Okay. Robin, are thank we you. done? That is it. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you, commissioners and staff. <laughs>